Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. I'm going to call the meeting to order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bow your heads with me, please. Dear Lord, you challenge us to do more than sing and pray, but to go out and work as though the very answer to our prayers depended on us and not upon thee. Keep us, we pray, in perfect peace. Help us to walk together, pray together, sing together, and live together until that day when all God's children, black, white, red, and yellow, will rejoice in our common band of humanity in the kingdom of our Lord and of our God we pray. Amen. Amen. Dr. Martin Luther King, 1956. Nice. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. these uh, on topic or are part of the speakers at the later portion of the meeting? I have not seen the final list, but the first one I thought was the diversion center, and then the second two was um, moratorium, and I didn't see the last one. Looks like they're both moratorium. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, we have four speakers. Um, one is on, as the clerk has just indicated, the Diversion Center, and then three others on the moratorium. Um, is that Larry Brown, Jr.? Judge Brown. Mm -hmm. Judge Brown. Judge Brown. Oh, excellent. Yep. I should recognize that name. Yeah, he said he's going to be here. Where he's are been you? here. He yeah. may it's be the in the overflow. overflow. Yeah. Okay. Um, would someone check the overflow? There he is. Yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> I said Larry Brown Jr. I looked around and I, I, it didn't have your honor in front of it, so I didn't recognize you. It's just me. It's just me. And I was told that I have three minutes. Is that correct? That is correct. When does it begin? It already has. <laughs> <laughs> To this honorable board, to Chair Paisley, Commissioner Thompson, Commissioner Lashley, Commissioner Carter, and also Commissioner Turner, I stand before you as humbly as I know how to speak with you about a diversion center, a mental health diversion center. As the gentleman prayed this morning, it's time to stop talking so much. It's time to be about action. We have been talking as leadership within this community for years now in reference to a mental health diversion center and is yet to come to fruition. And it's time for Alamance County to have an inpatient mental health treatment facility. A Couple of things before we begin that I see as a judge, and I'm here to speak about the administrative, administration of justice and how a mental health diversion center will affect Alamance County and our judicial system. None of us can turn on our televisions, none of us can open our laptops, turn on our cell phones, open a newspaper, and not see how mental health is affecting our community. Alamance County is not immune to that. What do I see as a judge? I see people in crisis. What happens when a telephone rings at three o'clock in the morning and it's a CECOM calling our police department to say to an officer that you need to go out to a home because somebody is in crisis? That person may be suffering from a mental health crisis, maybe suicidal. And that officer, he or she does their job without hesitation, and they go to this home to help somebody that's in need. Then what happens when they get there? 
and they see that this person is suicidal. They see that this person is going through a mental health crisis. In Alamance County, they have nowhere to turn but IVC to be involuntarily committed for that individual to go to our ARMC hospital to try to receive treatment. And to our men and women who are on the front lines every single day as nurses, as our doctors, I salute those men and women because they are doing everything they can to keep Alamance County safe. But what happens when that person is released, sometimes possibly 24 hours later, because we all know that our hospitals are overworked and understaffed. So what happens when that individual now goes back out into our community and he or she has not received the assistance that they need, that they don't so desperately need? What happens when our officers are inside of our jail and those men or women are trying to keep our individuals who are in custody safe? And all of a sudden that person is going through a mental health crisis and that officer has nowhere to turn to. They don't have anywhere in Alamance County where we can send that individual other than guess what? To be involuntarily committed. Our jail is not a psychiatry department. Our jail staff is not equipped to be therapist. Our police officers are not social workers, but we expect for them to have all the tools that they need, but we're not supplying that for them. Our jail staff needs to know that if somebody is going through crisis, we have somewhere here in Alamance County. Our police officers need to know that if somebody's in crisis, is that three minutes? <laughs> Can I please, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm gonna make it quick. What happens if that individual doesn't have anywhere to turn to? A diversion center will allow us possibly up to 14 beds that are right here in Alamance County where that person can go. What happens with our community when our community sits there and they don't know where to turn to because we have no facility right here in Alamance County. I'm, I'm requesting this honorable board to look at creating the diversion center where we would have up to 14 beds with medical staff that are present that can treat that individual who's going through crisis, not just return them to our streets so they can break in possibly more houses, break into more vehicles, commit more alleged robberies, so that we can have somewhere for them to go for up to 14 days to receive those mental health services. And then connect, because we will have a mental health staff that's present, we would have people who are authorized with medications to provide medications, they would have staff there that can assist this person for 14 days to get stable. And then watch this. They would then have an individual that can connect them to services within our community or connect them with services at a different location for inpatient treatment that can help this person to kick his or her habit or to help this individual to help them through their crisis. Right now, we have nowhere to turn. Our community needs this. Our officers need this. Our social workers need this. Our community and the people we all serve need a mental health diversion treatment facility. Please don't ignore the needs of the people. Please, let's stop talking about things. Let's get it done together. And thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Judge Brown. <laughs> Judge Brown, if you'd like, you can sit here in the front if you'd like, if you want to stay with us here. Well, I would like to stay, but I don't mind. I'm going to sit. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me explain. Uh, now, his honor got over three minutes, and I appreciate but also apologize because uh, tonight with the crowd we have, we're going to have to limit you to three minutes, and I apologize for not having announced that prior to the first speaker. Uh, Judge Brown, we're not saying anything at all we appreciate what you have and and you're singing to the choir I think but having said that uh, three minutes please okay next speaker Jennifer Dur Duran is that correct Dwayne Dwayne thank you state your name and your address please Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Duane, uh, 2709 Quakenbush Road, Snow Camp. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address you this evening. I have lived in Snow Camp for nine years. I'm one of several co-founders of the Snow Camp Community Action Network, also known as Snow Camp CAN. We are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to protecting Snow Camp from environmental threats and unchecked and unregulated development. I appreciate the opportunity to address a rising level of concern about the influx of heavy industry in our community.
Today, we had an explosive reminder of this growing problem when a tremendous boom emanated from the Alamance aggregate's mine today. A grim reminder of what can happen when heavy industry is allowed to proliferate a rural residential community unchecked and unmanaged by our community leaders. Our home is over two miles away from the epicenter of this blast, yet I heard it loud and clear. Which leads me to the reason I'm here this evening. County Planning Board moved uh, to not, moved forward to not <laughs> pro approve the proposed zoning ordinance for Snow Camp. At the same time, the board elected to maintain a subcommittee to work on tightening the provisions regulating class three permits. Mm -hmm. Under the current unified development ordinance, also known as UDO. This happened on February 10th, just last week. And this was in response to a number of objections uh, to the snow camp ordinance. The, the county planning board voted not to move forward. At the same time, the board elected to maintain a subcommittee to work on tightening the provisions regulating class three permits under the unified development ordinance, also known as the UDO. Most community members who co commented, including an opposing faction, expressed a common desire for our residents, the planning board and the commissioners to have a greater control over class three industry permit applications. It was clear from the comments of the opposing faction that many of those who opposed the zoning ordinance do not understand this. Alamance is the only county in the North Carolina Piedmont that does not have a zoning ordinance and is the only county that cannot say no to heavy polluting industry that is not compatible with the surrounding community. <coughs> so no wonder we are such a ripe target. As such, we will continue to be a target by those industries due to the ease of obtaining permits under our current checklist system. According to the Planning Board Vice Chair Jean Brooks, 86% of respondents to the county's own survey called for restriction or not permitting all heavy, class three heavy industry, and there were 200 and 85 signers I'm going to of have the to petition. Call, call hold. I apologize. I am going, Our we just speaker, want to call for an extension of the moratorium, please. The next speaker is Ron, and Ron, I apologize. I cannot read your handwriting. Thank you. Good evening, and uh, I'm at uh, Ron Spinhoven at uh, 2709 Quickenbush Road in Snow Camp, and I was um, have been involved with the uh, from the from the onset with the moratorium uh, for the heavy industry in in Snow Camp. I also worked uh, with the or on the um, steering committee for the for the zoning um, plan, and um, am disappointed in the turn of events at the last board meeting. But I I think what we need to do is to continue this moratorium until everyone can work out, or the planning board can now work out. Um, a better solution to the heavy industry. So I'm going to urge you to please vote to extend the, the moratorium on heavy industry tonight and, um, and, and hopefully soon we can get a resolution on how to curb it in, in uh, snow camp. Or apparently in the whole county now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Joe Thompson. Mm 
Hi, Joe Thompson, 821 Soapstone Trail, Snow Camp. Um, I want to take just a few seconds to, to just second what the judge has said. I had uh, my mother suffer from severe mental illness in the latter part of her life, and I have a nephew right now who is in jail awaiting sentencing because of mental illness. So I think he is on the right track. Um, I'm here just, to, just, just briefly to say that I support extending the moratorium. I understand that the zoning may be dead. Um, and I think the reason that, that I would like to see you guys do something with, with the ordinance is that it empowers you to say no. If there's, if there's a industry that comes to Alamance County that you don't feel is, is right for the area, the location, or anything, I would like for you guys to be able to say no to that. And that's, that's all I have to say. Thank, thank you. you. And we thank you. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Those are the only speakers we have that are on topic. Uh, Chairman, Chair, please. I didn't get a chance to sign up. Uh, they had me out there. I couldn't get to the paper. Mm -hmm. okay. I think, as with one of the other speakers, I think we already know where you stand, and I totally <laughs> understand, but I would ask that you not speak simply because I don't want to open it up to the entire floor. Uh, but I think you've made it very, very clear where you are and, and we understand your position. And I thank well, you. I would like to let it be known that some people say I don't live in Snow Camp. I do. My address is 4716 Green Road, Snow Camp. And my ancestors had the post office in Snow Camp, the original post office at a store. And my great great grandfather settled there in 1835 with owned land there ever since. And and we understand where you, where you are and we know you. Well, some Thanks. people are saying we're not so bad. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, commissioner responses. I like that. No <laughs> response. <laughs> okay, do we have a motion as to the agenda, Mr. Chairman? I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to correct the error of, a commission, of omission of the public hearing on the extension of the moratorium and move that in at item 6A. I think it would be 8. No, I think it would be 8. Oh, eight. Yeah. It's oh be yes, okay, excuse me. Eight. Oh, item 8A, eight eight or 8-1. Eight, eight Toy said 7A. 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 7A is correct. 7A, 7A and 7A. B. 7A. Thank you, Tori. I'll second that motion. Any discussion? Just a question for Mr. Haygood. Mr. Haygood, was that public hearing noticed? It was, uh, per the per requirements. All right, thank you. And I have a copy of that notice if anybody, if any of the commissioners would I'll like to see it. it. Right. If you want to see, see it. it. That's all. Before we vote, let me uh, explain Mr. Carter's motion. Uh, we had a public notice of extending the moratorium, and we've been advised by legal counsel that we must have the public hearing on that. So there will be two items on the public hearing. One will be as to the modification of the HIDO. The other will be uh, the extension of the moratorium. Uh, that doesn't mean it will happen. It means we have a public hearing on it. Is that correct? Uh, modification to the UDO, not the HIDO. I'm sorry. UDO. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. We have the motion to amend, and that's carried. Now do we have a motion for approval of the amended agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Carries unanimously. All right. How about the consent agenda? So motion moved. Approved. Or second. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lashley made the motion and Mr. Carter made the second. In discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Carries unanimously. Now we're going into uh, 
what's been shown as 7A, 7B, or 7, 1 or 2, or whatever it's going to be. Um, do we have a motion to open the public hearing? So move. Second. Now, do we need to do this in two sections or one section? Uh, for the moratorium extension, be first. All right. Mr. So, Chairman, and then afterwards, I can speak, uh, and it'll just be one item, B and C. I can speak at length for both of them. All right. So this is the, your motion is to extend the moratorium, is that, or to hear, to, to the, public the public hearing, hearing yes, to the, the public. All right. Excellent. And we have a second in discussion. All in favor signify by opening the hearing by aye. 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 Okay, any negative? Hearing none, unanimous. Okay, we are now in the public hearing as to the extension of the moratorium. Legal counsel, do you need any explanation whatsoever? I don't know. Deborah, do you have anything? Well, yeah. Well, no, just very, very little, but this is an advertised public hearing for the extension of the moratorium. Currently, that moratorium is scheduled to expire on February 28th, 2022. Public hearing's been advertised according to statute both on February 10th and February 17th. That's all. Any discussion? Any speakers as to the extension of the moratorium? Oh, yep. Excuse me. I would like to just finish my comments if I would please. Uh, you have three minutes. Yeah. Great. I thought it was five minutes for public hearing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry? For a public hearing, is it not five minutes? Uh, after Great. consulting with legal counsel, um, I was told by legal counsel it could be either three or five. And I think we decided three minutes. Okay. Well, how about if I take 10% of that? 10% <laughs> of three minutes. Sure. Okay. We all approve shorter. <laughs> I think you heard what I said. Um, I'll just step back one paragraph. So according to Planning Board Vice Chair Jean Brooks, 86% of respondents to the county's own survey called for restriction um, of or not permitting all class three heavy industry. And in addition, there were 285 signers of a petition uh, that we put out stating the same. What we need from you, what we are requesting our County Board of Commissioners to do now is extend the moratorium on any class three permit applications until consideration of all options to address the concerns is complete. Two, the extension of the moratorium will allow the planning subcommittee to continue to study how they can meet the requirements from the planning board motion to strengthen rules and regulations concerning class three heavy industry in our community. And last and most importantly, thank you for your service and your thoughtful consideration. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Anyone what else on this side? Yes, in the very back row. I'll come back to you. Thanks for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Trip Overholt, and I live on 1574 Major Hill Road on Sorry. Snow Camp. Did you say Overholt? Overholt, okay. yes. And uh, I've been a resident for 30 years, and I love Snow Camp. It's such a beautiful place, um, just beautiful nature, and it's a wonderful community of folks and um, absolutely in love with snow camp. So that's why I'm speaking from the heart here to tell you that if you were to go to the, the meetings that were had on the, uh, the, the quarry that was approved, you, would have, you, you guys all know that there was overwhelming uh, support of the community to have that permit uh, revoked. Um, it didn't happen because of uh, the way that the um, existing rules were, but that business wouldn't have come to Alamance County if there had been rules in place that would have had them go through a little bit more scrutiny than they went through. And they were able to get that permit kind of from the shadows. And so we're not, you know, anti, uh, those of us, in, we, we all work and we understand people have to make a living, but there should be a reasonable process uh, that a business has to go through that's not gonna diminish the, the value of the community or the value of the homes in the community 
And there needs to be some consideration of what the real economic positive impact is going to be. It can't just be like half a dozen people are operating a conveyor belt or whatever, a couple of trucks. I mean, the trucks right now thunder down the road to the mine, et cetera. And so, okay, that, that happened. But I think all of, all of us as adults should have the opportunity to use the expertise that we've accrued, to have an opportunity for citizens to weigh in, and for you guys yourselves to be able to look at the evidence, weigh it, have a little time to decide, not have a, a checklist um, that somebody simply has to go down and then basically the rules, the rule comes from the state. Who would want the state to impose a ruling over the, over the county commissioners? So it just makes good sense. And the only way now that we can have some sort of process that's gonna result in that is gonna be if you extend the moratorium. So there's quite a few people here tonight that feel that way. They're not all gonna speak. And there are hundreds more at home that do. There are a few, we're, we're not anti-industry per se, but there's got to be a sensible process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman right here had his hand up next. I don't take my mask off. Hear me a little better yes, here. Again, you. Eric Henry. <laughs> I'm a resident of Snow Camp for about 10 years. I've actually lived in Alamance County and for over 60 years. And we're at a junction in our time. Development is coming to Alamance County. And we have an opportunity to decide what that is. And we have learned from the Snow Camp mine when we have no rules in which to play by. So I'm asking you to extend this moratorium, to give us more time. I've been to those meetings and I've heard those discussions around the rock quarry. Let's decide the future of our community and not have the community's future decided by somebody else. We have the power, you have the power. So yes, we didn't get the ruling that we wanted a couple weeks ago from the planning board, but if we can just get some more time to have this extension to look this further so we can plan for the future that benefits all of Alamance County and not just let development come to us and then put you on the defensive to decide how to defend us. So again, thank you so much for your service and appreciate you being here tonight. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey everybody, my name is Crystal Cavalier. I live in Pleasant Grove, 5123 Highway 119 North. and. Um, I too would like for you guys to extend the moratorium on this class because up in the northern part of the county we're dealing with also an asphalt plant and a um, rock mine. And so you guys know how dangerous it is for us and we just want you guys to have the power to say no just like you said no to the MVP Southgate coming through. We guys want you to have that power to say that. So thank you so much for allowing me to speak and Sheriff Johnson and Judge Brown thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on this side of the room? She was in the overflow room. Uh, I understand. That. Can we'll I ask her a question? Mm -hmm. Crystal, is this what you're talking about? Isn't it on Highway 62? Yes. Because I used to work in Caswell County and there's not a tree. It's just scant. So I, I just wonder if that was it. It's on the left going toward. It is. It's out in a little town township called Anderson. Right. And I grew up out there. My family's from there. We've been there since, I don't know, forever, 1600. So. Okay. Please consider this extension. I really appreciate that. Yeah, Thank Anderson you. is in Caswell County, is it not? Anderson, it's right there on the line, mm -hmm. but it still has a Burlington address. All right. Thank you. So thank you so much, the Okanichi Saponi. Thanks, you. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to open to this side, and Mr. Owens, I'm going to ask you to come up. Uh, now you'll get to three minutes. <laughs> I don't think I'll take three minutes. You know, I find it ironic, commissioners, that some of the people that are making the most noise about the rock quarry are enjoying a rock quarry. Not just by buying a rock, they live in Soapstone Mine, which was a rock quarry. And they get to look at a beautiful man-made lake. I used to hunt that farm for years before it ever got developed, even the land that's a rock quarry, and it was all, only thing it was really good for was rock. And uh, I find it ironic that these people who don't like this rock quarry, they like the one they live in, and because uh, they live in one. But that being said, you know, they keep wanting to talk about what's coming. Don't let somebody else decide what's coming to Southern Alamance County. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If it wouldn't rock there, that rock really wouldn't be there. There's not going to be no heavy industrial coming to Snow Camp of any size without water 
and sewer. And snow camp does not have neither one. And they won't they can talk at all they want and shout fire, 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 but heavy industry is not coming to snow camp. I don't care about the Toyota plant. We don't have water and we don't have sewer. And so the, I think they're pushing pulling a, a fire alarm that don't need to be pulled. And they don't y'all don't need to extend the moratorium because this has been going on since 2018. You heard from the planning board. You, the UDO, they can, the planning board can still be working on that right along without the extension. They can work on that. You don't have to keep extending the moratorium. But that's basically all I had to say. I didn't know this was going to be tonight or you know, I'd been better prepared. But we, I'm like this guy except for I don't want nobody in Burlington or Graham to tell me who I can sell my land to. And when you start saying this business is appropriate but this one isn't, that's about opinion. What's somebody's opinion is good and bad. You know, I don't like this but somebody else might like it. So I don't want anybody from government stepping on my rights, our constitutional rights on my property for no reason. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else on this side of the, the room? Yes, sir. Bill Pope. I'm uh, from Snow Camp. Obviously, you guys know me. And I'm in with the planning board. Now, uh, what and we give voted. Give us your, your address for the record. I'm sorry? Give us your 1907 record. Quake and Bush Road, Thank Snow you. Camp, North Carolina, 27349. Um, so when the motion was passed that we were to um, not pursue or recommend the zoning, that we were going to continue to address what was the major concern uh, with the area in the southern part of the county was the class three high dose. All right. Um, stuff like the rock quarries, asphalt plants, paper mills, those sort of issues. All right. So from my perspective, um, I wouldn't mind seeing the moratorium extended a little bit while we address that. Now, our charge moving forward is addressing uh, the class three high dose for the whole county. All right. But in the meantime, I would, I guess, and I think we're going to be close on that within the next, you know, couple. We're, we're meeting every week for as a small group and then twice a, a month as a planning board. And I believe in the next two or three weeks, we'll have something to recommend in, in that regard. It's not going to be that, that hard. Uh, it's only based on a couple home run issues, which is land spacing and setback stuff, right? So uh, I wouldn't want to see something jump in there ahead of coming up with that resolution for the snow camp area until we, we got that solved. That's, that's all I'm going to say in support of that. So we don't have permitting. We possibly could have permitting in the northern part of the county uh, as we're working on this, but it's, it's throwing a bone to the southern part of the county on this, as you know what they've been through. So that's all I really got to say. I suppose you're asking for the extension, extension of the, the moratorium only, just to not zoning. Not zoning. No, no. That uh, that was um, voted by the planning board not to re recommend zoning going forward. So that that ship sailed. All right. So now we're just working on the class three uh, high dose stuff, and that mm -hmm. was again a, a recommendation uh, from our planning board to continue with that. And that's so. Extending the moratorium to me would just be um, to see that work through. I don't think we'll have to go through. I think the moratorium extension was for three months. I don't believe it'll need that much time um, till we be able to produce something and come to a public hearing on that. So that's all I've got. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Anyone else on this side of the room? Is there anyone in the annex? left or do we know mr chair while he's checking if i may i did get a set of written comments from a lady who was not able to attend tonight I'll go ahead and read all right um There's nobody in the back room all right please go Good evening. My name is Jane Lee Hicks, and I live on Quaken Bush Road. 
I am commenting on the U though. I was fully expecting a public hearing tonight to extend the moratorium on heavy industry permit applications as it was published in the newspapers and on your website. I understand that it was omitted from the agenda as a result of the vote at the February 10th meeting of the planning board to not recommend the zoning ordinance to the commissioners and that the planning board is now charged with tightening the regulations under the UDO section 6.5 HIDO for class 3 industry permits. I am requesting that a moratorium be imposed on class 3 heavy industry permits to provide sufficient time for the planning board to complete their review and make their recommendations to the commissioners. And that is all. Thank you. Thanks. With no other speakers, do we have a motion to close this portion of the public hearing? Motion to close. Second. In discussion, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous that we close it. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to extend the moratorium in order to allow our planning board significant, sufficient time to complete their amendments and corrections or adjustments to the plan, uh, to the uh, IDO and for a period of 60 days. You wish to limit it as to what your motion is to? Oh, to, well, for, I just said for the, for the purpose of making adjustments or amendments to the IDO to improve it. Period. Just say. So. I'll second your motion, Mr. Carter, just Thank to get this on the vote. Can I just ask a question? After this period of time, what what's going to happen? Because when I first come on the commissioners, that was when I mean, we got hit with that, and we should have because we were elected and. and whatever was the day before is ours the day after. And I'm just curious as to what's going to happen in 60 days because I really don't think the, the opinions in this room or wherever at are going to change. And um, I'm just curious about um, is this to try to fine tune this with the planning board because we've been to the planning board meetings. And it ain't fine tunes yet. <laughs> and I, I just, I don't want to keep people in the air about something when we need, I, I just um, I, I just don't like to keep putting things off when it looks as though it might not change, or it might, but I, I mean, because the planning board has got total different opinions in themselves. Some of them wanted to cancel the whole thing, some of them didn't, and that's what to expect because you're all very different people. So um, I'm just wondering when is this going to come to a decision to what it is? Because I've heard if, if you don't have the zoning, something can come in. If you do have the zoning, something can't come in. But I've heard the gazebo has a certain height that can't be in my backyard. That That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, and maybe it was a, a big document that's that document that goes around to places that are looking at zoning because somebody formulated it. I'm, I'm just curious as to when this is going to have a resolve. Well, the purpose of the, my motion was to give the planning board additional time to make the any adjustments or improvements to the HIDO that they think might be necessary to protect Alamance County citizens. Right. 60 days is an arbitrary number. Okay. We don't know. Mr. Poe said he might be able to have it done in a month or less. We don't know if it can be it done in a month or less or not, but if they can, then they bring it back to the board and we either approve it, their changes or we don't. That's all it does. This has nothing to do with zoning. This just has to do with giving them time to ad address the issues in the any issues they see in the HIDO. As far as where we stand if we don't issue if we don't do a moratorium where we will be on March the 1st is that any business that complies with any existing rules under the existing HIDA will be able to make a request a permit for construction or development and proceed with it if they meet all the criteria 
So if they're going to tighten them up, this gives them an opportunity to tighten up any of those remaining items in time for us to then allow the moratorium to expire. Well, I just want us to remember, because I'm like an elephant, I don't forget, I don't know where I parked at Walmart, but I don't forget <laughs> this, that when we first come on and we voted to extend this for months, all the emails we got was, thank you, thank you so much, because now we can get this fixed. We can close that. And, and I'm, we're not going to delay things to give people a false sense of hope if there isn't one. And I mean, it's, it's, this you is ugly. There is one. Okay, well, this is, this is kind of ugly when it's your, in your yard. It really is. And um, I, just, I, just, I just think the five of us, if this is what we're going to have to decide, we need to really have to decide it. And, um, and the planning board's got a lot of pressure on them. And, and it just takes everybody's talking to really kind of pull the bits and pieces out of something like that to really benefit everybody. Um, that balance is crucial when it comes to a community. Snow Camp is a great community. My mom's address is that, and I'm very protective over it. And uh, when you get something that kind of plops in your backyard, you know, I haven't heard one word about anybody that sold all this property to this place or the ones that benefited it financially by selling land to this place. I haven't heard anything about them. Are they still in the country? <laughs> I mean, the, but somebody had to buy this land from somebody, and I haven't heard anything about these people. Like, if I owned all this land and I sold it, I would think somebody would be really ticked off at me. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I hadn't heard one part about that group of people. That's all I'm saying. And I, I just, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to watch people go at it, and, and you have a right to because it's your backyard. And there's a, whenever there's a cause, there's an effect. And I, I got a video today, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, I just, you know, whatever this place is, at this day and time, it best not be breaking the law. So that's, that's all I got to say. Commissioner Carter, this is Deborah. I just want to clarify. I understand you, you said your motion is to extend the moratorium for 60 days. Is that specifically would be through April 30th, 2022, at the, the 60 days at the end of the current moratorium. Is that correct? Correct. So we're really talking about more like 90, 90 or 50 some days. Can't we just put a date on it? And it expires 228, so, two, so March 1, well, yeah. get in line. So can, we we make, it, it. can we make it May 1st, en encompass a full two months? He would have to modify, modify his motion to do that. I'm just curious. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, it, 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 it's no, no, he doesn't need to modify it. I'm simply clarifying that when he said 60 days, he meant at the expiration of the existing moratorium as opposed to from today's date. That just wasn't stated Correct. one way or the other. And it should be, it, it's better and cleaner if it goes 60 days from the expiration of the current moratorium and specifically to April 30th, 2022. Would like that not be 62 days then, I guess? No, April 30th is when it expires. Mm -hmm. It should be, be 60 long. days from April 3rd. Just why not so just put June. a date in the motion for, for instead of the date? in March, but ordinances are always better and it's easier for everybody who operates them under them if we can put it through to the end of a month. So why not just put a date on there instead of a number of days and say April 31st? 30 days. <laughs> It's 30 days in April. Yeah. 30 days. I don't know. April 30th, 2022, please. That's, that's Judy taught that little ditty about yeah. that. Yeah. what days. I don't remember that one. So um, are, you try, are you asking to modify your motion? Modify my motion to say April the 30th. And are, you, modify, you. are you agreeing with the modification? Yeah, that's, that's fine. That's fine. Right. I'll, I'll just say that what Ms. Thompson said is basically how I feel, Mr. Owens. Um, I'm going to give them another 60 days. But I'm not going to be doing much after that. They're going to have to show me something. And I think that you folks are right in the sense that the HIDO needs to be looked at carefully, and we are doing that. I promise you that. I promise you that. But I'm going to give them another 60 days 
But I feel like, Ms. Thompson, what's the end game? Been since 2018. Yes, sir. Four years. And, you know, four years, another 60 days. And I look to Bill Poe. Uh, I will, like, maybe reach out to you in the next couple of weeks to see where you are. Yes, sir. I'd, I'd like, to, uh, like to talk to you about that. Thank you. Let me remind everyone that the planning board can recommend to us modifications whether we extend this moratorium or not. So the moratorium extension is not necessary <coughs> for that to take place. Except for the protection. Right. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just have a couple questions for Mr. Poe. How many meetings is the planning board going to have between now and April 30th? Well, we're meeting uh, every Thursday for, as a sub uh, uh, committee, and then, of course, then uh, every uh, uh, two weeks as a, uh, a planning board, full planning board. So, uh -huh. just like um, when we last met as a planning board, we had at six o'clock we had the subcommittee meeting that we over there at the historic courthouse, and everybody could have come come to that. I think most of y'all have, uh, and we had uh, um, discussion. A period there amongst the subcommittee, and then we had our planning board meeting. We had a, a subcommittee meeting last Thursday right here in this room, and we're going to have another one next Thursday with a planning board meeting again. Right. We'll run through that until we have two things addressed. Um, it's not only this um, uh, the class three, whatever we come up with that work, and then as a planning board, we've also been charged with um, uh, mobile home and RV park. That's uh, right work on that as a, a board, so. all right thank you I mean um, mr. chairman it's been it's been a year uh, certainly not uh, thrilled about extending it but I don't know that uh, well I'd like to do a 30-day extension but I don't think there's enough time to do that and have this board take action after that so begrudgingly I'd support 60 days but I won't support anymore Any other discussion? As to the extension of the moratorium to April 30, 2022, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. For 30 days, excuse me, April 30 only. Mr. Poe? Yes. Okay. Um, Good job. You want to go into the second? Um, yes, sir. You have a motion. I can step up and speak. Yes, sir. And we're ready for the second portion of the open here of the uh, public hearing. Yes, sir. Good evening, board. We are here to discuss uh, amendments to the current Unified Development Ordinance. Uh, these amendments, uh, there are three of them we need to look at. The first of which is going to be uh, amending to include uh, criminal penalty language as required by Senate Bill 300 recently passed by the North Carolina General Assembly. Essentially, that uh, change is going to be located within the ordinance itself and it just includes specific language to make uh, the ordinance actually criminally enforceable if it wishes to go that far uh, and it adds just pursuant to North Carolina general statute section 14-4 uh, that was again done thanks to the criminal reform bill the second is going to be an amendment to include additional language uh, discussing the junk car and automobile graveyard ordinance to include language that was previously in the old UDO and is now being brought over into this new one. Just to bring it up to date, this is a UDO has been a work in progress with everybody. So this is just to fill in some gaps. And then lastly, there is gonna be a uh, proposed amendment to the subdivision standards. Uh, doing so would strike language that's already existing and allow for uh, individuals to record plats with the Register of Deeds. Uh, currently, uh, all plats in Alamance County are recorded on Fridays. By striking the language that's already in there, it can be done five days a week. So just streamlining the process. Do we have a motion to open the public hearing? 
move. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, it carries unanimously. Do we have any speakers as to this item? Do we have a motion to close the we public hearing? The, oh, I'm sorry. I want to see if there's anybody in there that wants to come in here now that they. And Mr. Walker, if there are, just ask them to move over here. Is there anyone else over there? Uh. I would note in the crowd we have uh, doctors, we have the high sheriff, we have generals, we have uh, judges. <laughs> Senators. <laughs> it, where do we have a senator? Right there. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Forrest, good to see you. <laughs> I told them there was more room if they wanted to. All right. Excellent. Okay. And there are no other speakers. Is that no correct? Other speakers, sir. All right. We have a motion and a second to close. Is that correct? Yes. All in favor of closing, say aye. 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 Sorry. Unanimous. Thank you. Yes. Okay. As to this item, do we have any discussion and or motion? Uh, I've got a question, Mr. Chairman. Um, Patrick, with respect to the uh, the rec recordation change, I don't see that the striking of the language says anything about when you can record. Is there something? I'm looking on page 84 of the packet. Is there anything that I'm... It looks like we're just striking language, but I don't see that it changes when you can record and when you don't. It is my understanding that the planning board releases the plats on specific days. So striking this would allow them to just open it up and have it be picked up by citizens on any business day. It would allow the individual asking for that uh, matter to go and record on their own as opposed, as opposed to the planning board doing the recordation. Okay. Is that correct? Because the administrator is the planner, the administrator in the statute is the yes. is the, the planner of the planning board of the planning department. Planning That's department. Right. Okay. All right. We need a motion to approve. I just got a question. I know what abandonment is. I know what junk is. Mm -hmm. What is nuisance motor vehicles? This is motor vehicles or vehicles that are left semi abandoned. Uh, that could be uh, blocking someone's driveway, blocking traffic, or otherwise causing a nuisance to the public. Okay. Sometimes you see them on the interstate with a tag rag hanging out forever. So that's a nuisance. That would be higher patrols jurisdiction to handle that. Sorry, you don't get that one. <laughs> Again, just clarification from our county attorney. Uh, my understanding is on this item three, it simply would then be released to the contractor, to the home, to whomever for recordation, which would expedite the recording. It wouldn't be held up by the planning department. Very well. And expedite the closing process for everyone. Correct. It just hurries it up. Mr. Chairman, do we need a motion to approve this? We do. I'll make that motion. I'll second. second. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. And are you going into the B portion, sir? Uh -huh. Or does that take care of the B portion? That would take care of the B portion. Uh, they are essentially the same. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Tega, uh, Ms. Watlington, I think is making this next presentation. Yes, yes. She is here. Glad to have. Hey, good evening, everybody. Good evening. So I was asked to come and speak before you about the kind of where we are with our domestic violence um, shelter services. Um, Commissioner Thompson and I were on a meeting last week, week before last, yeah. um, and she asked some great questions. Um, and it kind of came up that the community really doesn't know what's changed and how it's changed. and. And I want to make sure folks are understanding that they still get services kind of the same way. 
So last year, um, at the end of June, our shelter had a huge COVID outbreak, um, which was to be expected. We honestly lasted longer than we thought we would without one. Um, during that time, we had some great conversations around what does it mean to have congregate living? So for those of you who don't understand what congregate living is, it is when everyone shares the same space. They share bathrooms, they share kitchens, sometimes sharing bedrooms, all of that. Um, and so just after COVID happened, we went to a space where they were not share, diff, separate families were not sharing the same bedrooms, but they still had to share the same kitchen, the same bathroom and other common areas. So during that time, we started to discuss, this isn't, this isn't going well. Um, and just, I would request that you all think about what it would be like to have experienced so much trauma. And then you need services, you need somewhere to stay temporarily that's safe. But then you have to go into this space with other people who live differently than you, who may or may not have children, who may parent different than you, but we are expecting after years of trauma that you go into this space and get along well. We've heard here, we have neighbors who don't live together who are struggling to get along. <laughs> so imagine this space. Um, and so at that time, we thought, what would this look like if we went to non-congregate living? That means each individual family has their own space. They don't have to share common areas. Um, family Abuse Services already owned um, a small um, apartment complex unit, four units. And so after the outbreak, we decided let's, let's move forward with this. Our board was fully support, supportive of that. Um, and there were some other issues going on inside the space that we were using. Um, and so since that point, we have been doing that. We have also been utilizing hotel spaces um, for smaller families and for single individuals. Um, I ran some numbers earlier this afternoon just to give you some context of kind of where we are. And because I do understand that some people think we have been um, serving less people, the numbers do not show that. <laughs> the numbers do not show that. So just for context, um, and these are, these are Family Abuse Services fiscal year. So from July 1, 2018 through 630, 2019, we served 143 individuals. That means adults and children. They stayed um, an average of about 115 days each. Um, and that was about an average of 12 clients a month. And that was before we went to non-congregate living, before COVID, before all of that. Um, then July 1st, 2019 through 630 of 2020, which was about, you know, five, five or so months into COVID, um, we served 183 adults and children, averaging about 123 days each, about 15, you know, 15 families, 15 people a month. And then in July 1st, 2020 through um, June 30th, 2021, we spiked. 243 adults and children, an average of 95 days. Um, and then that's about an average of 20 people a month. And then so far, we're going to exceed the numbers from the previous year. So from July 1st, 2021, which was last year, right after we went to non-congregate living through January 31st of this year, we served 145 individuals and that's, um, average of about 81 days. And one of the things I would say is you see the days dropping and I would attribute that to our housing program, which has been able to work with people to get them into permanent safe housing a lot faster than we ever have before. Um, so that's kind of where we are. Um, what questions do you all have? I'll ask one since I used to work for Family Services for four years. I know, years. Commissioner Thompson. Amazing, amazing <laughs> location. I mean, I've, I've, mm. um, I know a lot of folks have invested, I mean, the things that people give, church groups, um, you know, toiletries, everything. Mm -hmm. You cannot, it's almost like you need your own storage unit itself. We um, have one. <laughs> I know. We have to get one. There, there's been a lot of money put into the shelter with upfitting. Because I remember when I've been in it before, years ago when Mary White was the um, director, 
Um, I'm telling you what, you could get somebody to paint a room. I mean, it's, you know, because it has to be so safe, so secure. Come on over to the shelter and help me. No, nobody has to know where it is because there have been women who have been killed at a shelter from their abuser. So the safety line has all kind of degrees on it. Um, but I know there's been a vast amount of money put into this shelter. And, and I just wonder, because um, the kitchen looked like Martha Stewart got a hold of it. I mean, it was, and I walked over, I thought, wow. And, and I just, I just am curious about that money. I know TANF funds used to be a big deal. I don't know how that is anymore. That's been years ago. Yeah. And I will tell you, um, we had a Governor's Crime Commission meeting last week. I'm on the grant scoring. And the money's not going to be a whole lot different than it was last year, mm -hmm. which means but it's up about 90 agencies, like 200 and some agencies are going to be applying for money. So it, it's just, I just wish some people that are in charge of this money realize that just because people had COVID, they didn't stop killing each other. Nope. So, um, or abusing their children. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just curious about that, and I'm curious about uh, the motels that you're going, because I know this business, and, um, and that makes me nervous too, especially a motel where the door opens to the outside, so we not don't utilize, into a hall. Yeah, we don't utilize motels that kind of, I, I can't say which okay, hotels we utilize, but we do not utilize what you would consider a motel at all. Okay, what kind of stay are you looking, because when some of these whatever that victim looks like and her children leave in the middle of the night, they're wearing what they got. Kind of like when some are arrested, they come out wearing the same thing they wore in mm -hmm. and the season might have even changed. And so I'm just curious about um, what is their average stay that they would be on somewhere like that if they had to be put in, because that's big money. I mean, that, that can, your shelter is the biggest money of, a, of a, an agency because it's everything yeah. plus it's stay and yeah. it's food and it's everything yeah. so I was just curious what kind of finances is that looking at as far as the difference in an on-site shelter that you've had because just to add I can remember when we moved to the Justice Center there was a double wide trailer right beside on that corner grass lot when you first turn in mm -hmm. and we used to think what a great place for our shelter because we've got law enforcement right on staff right here mm -hmm. and um, we could have had our own little tunnel like we got to walk in the other day I got to walk in the tunnel oh my god the courthouse me and Bill they wanted to arrest us so bad but, um, but anyway and I thought a tunnel or just some kind of something to know that extra security is right there on site because I mean, people knew where the shelter was because law enforcement's in and out. I mean, we just talk, we're human. But uh, I've never understood why that wasn't located right at the Justice Center to just really have that extra all-in-one unit for that victim and their children. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, that's just me. I think I just need to win the lottery yeah. is what I need to win. I agree. I, I agree. So I'll address um, the first part of what you asked about, which was the money that went right. into the previous shelter. We could not have done the work without the community right. ever, even still. Um, and that was much appreciated. What I will say about that is the shelter was in the same place for 36 years. Mm -hmm. In the last 12 months prior to moving um, away from that, we had four kidnappings. Yeah. Because it became a space that's no longer safe for Alamance County residents. Because if you've been here any amount of time, it was nothing for people to call and say, hey, can I go stay at your shel shelter over on so-and-so right. street? And you'd be like, well, so now you, what I'm, so I hear you need a space. Let's find you one, but it can't be here because you just said, you, you already know where it is. Your person probably yeah. knows where it is. So we did not make that move without thought, I promise you. And it was hard for us because we've had that wonderful relationship with, with the church for so long but we needed to make that move yeah yeah well i'm sure that's um, difficult because that was such a comfort they always were there to yeah. stand up for the agency so quickly yeah. Yeah. and i'm not complaining about it I, i'm that's no. just my role is Absolutely. to ask about funding sure. because um we we just grants are just getting skinnier as they get yeah. and but the business you need them for is growing yes and what i will say about funding is the the good thing i, I believe about at least our shelter services i can only speak for ours that we are not um, the funding from Governor's Crime Commission is not used for our shelter services. Okay. We use um, the North Carolina Emergency Solutions Grant, and so that has been great. Like that, and that covers both hotels and shelter services. It covers food. 
it covers oper general operations of the shelter. So, you know, all the things that we would need, upkeep, maintenance, and all those things. Well, just for information, just FYI, yeah. when I was on the Domestic Violence Commission for six years, we had um, one of the departments of the Council for Women was really pushing hard to get the abusers program. Larry Judge Brown, you know this can be court ordered for the abuser to take the abusers program. You have to pay and you go monthly, you get counseling. Um, because I dare say if we put more into the abuser instead of putting everything on the backs of the victim to drag herself and her children around town finding somewhere to be safe, because I just like when she was three, she wanted to grow up to see Cinderella. She didn't want to be a batter wife. Just like he was three, he wanted to be a fireman. He did not want to be a batterer. This is learned behavior, and we are killing our children. We're teaching our children these really horrible behaviors. And so um, I just I just hope that, you know, when we tried this domestic one, we'd have these agencies. I thought I'd like to give a big shout out to Larry Blunt, who's in Alamance County, does a great job. He needs to be on the podium telling everybody else how to do this program and make a thing. And if and sometimes when they can't afford it, they get bumped. We pay so many things to help so many people. And if we ever really want to help domestic violence, we have got to focus on the abuser. And I checked the stats for the NC North Carolina, what is it, Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And every year they're still hovering in the 60s to the 80s. And it's just murder, suicide. That's the big thing now. That's all you see. And uh, we can put millions of dollars into domestic violence. But until we really face who's doing the harm and put some money into that, you're going to still have these stats and you're going to still want more money and everybody's going to think that's going to fix it. It's kind of like the schools. If we get another million dollars, it's going to fix a kid. We've got to fix that family, but that family's got to fix itself. So um, it's, just, um, it's just very sensitive to me. It's, this work is hard. And it I is. admire you because you've come up from the bottom all the way to the top and you hang I in there, girl, that. because you are that. a warrior. And it takes that to fight this. It's that ugly. So got my questions answered, I'll get off my box. <laughs> well, I do have a question. Ms. Thompson raised an interesting question to me, and that is when when a victim leaves a house with probably children in tow, with what the with the clothes on their backs, is the program providing wardrobes? We do we so shelter? what we do is we work with the victim to get what they need. So there are um, services, so Salvation Army is a place that we work with where they can get a voucher, go get what they need, and they don't have to pay anything. Okay. Um, if there are other things that they need, so they have small children who need diapers, we're going to go get them. Churches really rise up in this big time. When they're the community educator goes and speaks at churches, women's groups, whatever, I mean, you need a truck to haul it back. But we got to stop it somehow. Cain and Abel, just a rock. It's still happening, and, um, and it's... It's just it's awful. And what it does to children is teach, you teach your kid how to play soccer. You can also teach your kid how to harm somebody. And, um, and we've we got to do a better job. Money's not going to fix this. We thank you. You're welcome. I thought I saw a question brewing over here in the corner. That's all. It will contact. be a quick one. <laughs> thank you. I just want to say thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Calvin. I appreciate, appreciate it so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Dr. Ryan? Uh, yes, sir. Can Rob, can I talk to you go first? Absolutely. <laughs> Good evening, commissioners. Good evening. I'm Manager Hickett, staff members of the public. My name is Robin Huffman. I am a longtime resident of Alamance County, but for the purposes of tonight's meeting, I'm coming to you as the executive director of the North Carolina Psychiatric Association. And we are a medical society for physicians who specialize in mental health and mental illness. And our mission is advocating for the quality mental health care for all citizens in North Carolina. Before I went to work at NCPA, I worked in hospital administration in psychiatric hospitals here in North Carolina. And while I usually say um, I sleep in Burlington and I spend my time working out of town, um, for the last few years I have had the privilege to spend time here in Alamance County engaged um, in the Stepping Up Committee and in um, as an associate member of the Justice Advisory Committee. 
And y'all, I probably should just stop and let Judge Brown's comments go for the entire <laughs> evening. But, um, but tonight, um, you've talked a lot about jail diversion, and I'm here to give you a little bit of context and history because a lot of faces have changed here in the County Commission since this effort started. And one of the things that I need to say is that up until about 20 years ago, most counties in our state had what was the equivalent of a mental health emergency room, and it was called the Area Program. And here in our county, it was the Alamance Caswell Mental Health Center, and everybody in the community, the public, people with mental illness, law enforcement, everyone knew where to go when you or a loved one had a mental health crisis you went to the mental health center. And it was our mental health safety net in our community. So when mental health system reform started about 20 years ago, county mental health centers across our state closed, and so did a large number of our state psychiatric hospital beds are for mental health. The area programs became LME, MCOs, and instead of being the central place where people got care and where everyone went for mental health care, the LMEs contracted out with private agencies and private providers to deliver that care. Now, agencies and providers have different names and they have different locations, and they have locations that change, and so what happened um, is that no one actually came to know anymore where to go for help. They just, it just, we lost our mental health emergency room. So our safety net disappeared and the default safety net for people with mental illnesses became the hospital emergency room and it became our county jail. And all of us, I am betting money, have heard Sheriff Terry Johnson say more than one time that the Alamance County Jail is the largest mental health facility in our region. And it's true. But you all did something. Back in August of 2015, the Alamance County Commission signed a resolution to join the National Stepping Up Initiative. And this is a national initiative to reduce the number of people with mental illness in our jails. And that initiative has goals to reduce the number of stays, to reduce bookings, to reduce recidivism, to get folks connected to treatment. But you all did more than sign a resolution and put it on a shelf. Y'all did something. And because of that, Alamance County is actually seen as a leader in the state related to these kinds of issues. Alamance was one of 50 counties um, selected in the entire country to attend the National Stepping Up Summit in Washington, D.C. That was back in April of 2016. We came back enthused. We came back with a plan. We met with the county manager. We met with the sheriff. And that led to a September 2016, an Alamance County Community Dialogue. We had more than 70 community leaders, commissioners, city council members, law enforcement, judges, the DA, consumers, the hospital, providers, law enforcement. Um, key community leaders spent an entire day with a facilitator grappling with the gaps in our county's justice system and the problems with responding to people who had mental illness and co-occurring substance use disorder. We came up with a lot of strategies that day, but the number one priority that the group voted on back in 2016 was create a diversion center with access to assessment. And so that was the start of an effort. County leaders, the sheriff, county manager, the element steps up. We all worked together with support and a lot of elbow grease to work on the idea of a diversion center. And we all understood that things like this take time. Well, let's go three more years. In October of 2019, another community gathering took place. County leaders, consumers, judges, professionals, law enforcement agencies came together again 
Um, this time, we spent two days together doing a sequential intercept mapping exercise. And it was one more time where we looked at the gaps in our system related to the intersection of mental illness and the criminal justice system. And once again, the top priority identified by the participants in the county-wide exercise was create a diversion center. So for the past five or six years, our community has pulled together to work and push for a, a ju justice diversion center. We have received a million dollars from Cardinal Innovations, the LMEMCO, to support this vision and build this center. Um, we know that our new LME, VIA, supports a diversion center. Numerous members of the county have gone and looked at diversion centers all over the country and within our state to look at how to do it well, the problems and pitfalls to avoid. Um, even the legislators have been engaged in this. Just last fall, the North Carolina General Assembly appropriated $500,000 for Alamance County's Diversion Center. But still, we wait. On any given day in, um, here in Alamance County, a third of our county's 346 jail beds are filled with someone with mental illness. And while we were waiting for the diversion center, however, law enforcement and advocates did not stand still. The Sheriff's Department created a crisis intervention team with trained law enforcement officers who have truly made a difference in responding to those in crisis. County and municipal law enforcement agencies have increased the number of their officers who have CIT training in how to deal with folks with mental illness as well as our detention officers in the jail. We've got a um, position for a licensed clinical social worker in our jail. We've got a psychiatrist working in the jail several hours a week. We've increased the number of hours that our current mental health crisis provider is operating. The Burlington Police Department put a co-responder team in place a couple of years ago. And with the help of RHA, every other law enforcement agency in our county has done the same. But despite these efforts, we still have law enforcement officers and deputies who are spending large amounts of time. Um, they're not working on the streets and doing their law enforcement job, but they're sitting with people in crisis. Um, just a couple of months ago, one deputy spent 17 hours with, um, in the emergency room lobby with a child who was waiting to be seen in the emergency room. This week, on Thursday, the statewide CIT conference is taking place in Raleigh. And because of the work that's been going on in Alamance County for the last few years, we have had several people and several programs in our county who have been nominated for statewide CIT awards. And I'm going to be sitting in the audience on Thursday with bated breath and hoping to do some major applause for the work that's going on in Alamance County. And that's important, but maybe what the most important thing is when we have a chance to hear someone like Art Springer, who has been the president of our local NAMI, um, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, you hear Art talk and it will bring tears to your eyes when he talks about what a difference the last few years have made. What a difference an officer trained in mental health means to a person and to that person's family who's in crisis. So, despite of all the progress we're kind of making, and, and I wish Art Springer were here to say this, but if he were here tonight, he would be saying, why haven't we done this yet? We still need a diversion center. Um, back in 2016, when we were fresh and excited about this effort, um, the Sheriff's Department did a deep dive into some of the numbers and statistics. And now this was like six years ago, okay? And at that point in time, the county calculated that we only had 45 or 50 people with mental illness in the jail. And we know now it's about 100. And, that, um, and we also know that the cost of a person with mental illness in jail exceeds the average cost per day of a regular inmate detainee in the jail. So back then, we conservatively estimated that the additional cost to the county and to taxpayers was at least $1.2 million, the cost of caring for folks with mental illness in the jail, or just housing them in the jail. I'm not, um, we weren't treating them. Um, so today we know that that cost um, to the taxpayers is much higher. But I am not here to talk about dollars and cents. Um, I will close with saying, 
my forensic psychiatrists, the ones who are um, who testify in court, the ones who go visit patients in the jail and go talk to them, what they say to me with a lot of frequency, and in fact, we heard this here tonight, um, they say things like, but for the grace of God, there goes my cousin, my neighbor, my family friend. One missed dose of a medication for a chronic condition could lead to behaviors that would land them in jail or worse. And, and we, we heard that earlier this evening by one of the public speakers. So I'm just giving you a little bit of the history. Let me let you talk to Dr. Ryan about um, clinical stuff. Dr. Ryan. My name is Dr. Jim Ryan. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist and I have been in Alamance County for 40 years, 40 plus years. And uh, I was formerly the medical director at Alamance uh, Regional uh, of Psychiatry and before that at, at Alamance Memorial Hospital. So I've been around, I've seen quite a few patients. I'm currently semi-retired and have an office a few hours a week right up the street. Uh, and uh, so I'm in here in, in support of the Diversion Center. And what I would like to do is to present one patient to you, one case, one person. Uh, it's it's going to be fictitious, uh, of course, but uh, it's like many, many, many people I've seen before. And take you through the system, trying to take you through the system <clears throat> so that you understand where we've come and how far we've come and how far we've got to go. And, <clears throat> and with the idea that the, the the Diversion Center is going to help solve this. Okay, so we're talking about Mr. Smith, who's a 23-year-old male. And Mr. Smith had, had a little bit of a bad week, or two weeks, or three weeks. <clears throat> and right outside a window of the place he was walking by, he picked up a, a rock and threw it through the window. Of course, the people inside were a little bit scared. They looked out there and they saw him. He was a little bit odd to them. So they called 911. 911 at that point in time uh, <coughs> called the, the uh, police to uh, the police to go get it but 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 it this sounded like a mental health call possibly so we so a first responder went with the officer and that's what the first responder program is that had just been mentioned earlier went with the, the officer and <coughs> to the house and, and saw the, 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 this guy that's 23 years old. And, and at this point in time, they did an initial evaluation. And uh, so what had been going on for, with him is for, for the last three or four weeks, he'd kind of just gone downhill a little bit. He'd become slightly paranoid, but also developed auditory hallucinations, voices from outside of his head saying strange things to him. He also began thinking that people were putting thoughts in his head, and also thinking that people could hear what he was thinking. And so when they asked, why did you throw the rock through the window? He said that the people in that house were putting thoughts in his head, and if he threw the rock in the house, then he, would, he, he thought they would probably stop. So th this was obviously a red flag. And so they, rather than take him to the jail, which they would have done five years ago, uh, and then languished in jail. But now, of course, the, you know the jail is still has some of these people in them. But you know, it, there's more treatment in jail. They, they take them to the cur our current crisis center, which is an incomplete center, but it's doing a good job. At the crisis center, they've done the evaluation, and this is a first si time psychotic break, and so that they and this is at eight o'clock at night. Crisis Center now is open from 8 in the morning to 12 o'clock at night. So they give him some medicine and kind of symbolically hug him, you know, this, this guy is frightened to death, he's falling apart, and, and he knows he's falling apart. And he gets a little bit better, but they decide he needs to go to a hospital. So they call the hospital, and of course ours at this point in time, our emergency room is filled with people that need to get in their hospital. You just can't get somebody in there uh, at, at this point in time. And we don't have enough workers and they don't have enough beds or anything like that at this point. Uh, so th they sent him to Winston-Salem, which is, this is RHA we're talking about now, uh, just doing this. Uh, 
and, and so they call. Again, it's 8 o'clock at night. They've given them some energy, see down a little bit. Uh, and, and so the hospital in Winston-Salem tells them that, well, you know, we, we'd love to take this guy, but we can't do it till tomorrow morning. They always tell them that late at night. And so what happens is that they have to close at midnight. So this guy has been uh, evaluated twice already. He has to go to, to the emergency room. That's the only place to go. He goes to the emergency room. He gets reevaluated. He's up all night. He's starting to be more scared to death than ever. And he stays in the emergency room all night. And then they, he's taken to the hospital the next day. There he gets another evaluation, which is his fourth evaluation in 24 hours, which would be a little difficult for all of us, I think. Uh, he does get better at that <coughs> hospital, okay? Uh, and after about a week, after about a week, they discharge him, and they set up an appointment at RHA. Now, this guy's been in three, four, five different places to this <coughs> point, and he doesn't quite know where he was, and, and, and he doesn't quite know, you know, if RHA is the place for him. They've got him, they sent him home on medication. Again, the medi it's antipsychotic medication, which will probably be good. But this guy runs the danger at this point in time of not keeping his appointment. And, and that's probably going to happen. There's a slight chance, you know, 25% chance, that he is going to get back there and get the treatment he deserves. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times he won't. And if he, <coughs> if he doesn't get the treatment, you know, sure enough, even though he's better, a month down the road, the same thing happens again. And if it's, you know, if it's two rocks in the window, he might then have to wind up in jail. You, you never know about this kind of situation. Okay, so now, Let's say we have a diversion center, 24 hours. You go back and take the same person. Diversion center, 24 hours. So he, he gets there at 12 o'clock at night, okay? And, or he gets there at 8 o'clock and you go through the same thing. But with, with a, a diversion center, he gets to stay there all night. And the next morning, then he can go to the hospital. Skip, skip the Alamance Regional. He can go to the hospital in Winston-Salem. Now, he's also got more of an attachment to RHA here at this point, okay? So, so, <clears throat> so that when he gets a little bit better, when he gets a little bit better in the hospital, and he gets out and he has an appointment, he's much more likely to keep that appointment, and he needs to keep the appointment, uh, you know, in order to stay sane, basically. Uh, and so th that is the first value of getting the diversion center. Now, let, let's, let me take it one step further. <laughs> it's been proposed that we have facility services beds in there, which are these beds, uh, I don't know, 10 or 15, I don't know how many is proposed, <clears throat> in which it, the, the <clears throat> person can stay at the diversion center in a different little place there for, for f up to five days or six days. Now, if you have that diversion center, this Mr. Smith, this Mr. Smith, <coughs> will then be able to be transferred from, uh, the, 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 from, from the crisis center, the diversion part of it, to the facility service part, all in the same building, okay? And, and ha having do done that, he feels cared for, and again, he, he'll be, he'll, you know, we'll do the medicine, and we have a, a chance to see if the medicine works, and these are antipsychotic drugs we're talking about. And also, you know, he'll have group and he'll, he'll feel, you know, I think comforted in that situation. So, so that he gets into it in, in, within five, six days, he has a chance of getting into a almost non-psychotic state, less frightened uh, and less feeling like he's fallen apart. And he's also more likely to follow up. Now, let me, I'm gonna, for this particular kind of a problem, I wanna mention one other thing. Uh, at the, end of this, towards the end of this hospitalization, the doctor thinks, well, this medicine has worked on him, this particular antipsychotic. I'll use Risperidol. Risperidol has worked on him, and he's getting better and better. He's still a little bit psychotic, but he's almost better. Uh, and so then, so he brings up with the patient that, all right, you know what, rather than you have to take the medicine, let's just give you a shot. All you have to do is take a shot once a month, and, that, and that's it. And if you do that, if you're able to pull that off, 
And, and, they, and remember, the doctor has seen, the doctor has seen that, that he's handled this medicine pretty well. So he knows that that'll work. And, and, you know, all studies show if you're able to get somebody on <coughs> the long-acting injectable antipsychotic, they are going to stay on their medicine more and they're going to remain healthier for a longer period of time. Now also, in this particular case, in this particular case, <coughs> the taking care of the psychosis uh, for, for a first time break person, the quicker that you can do that, the better it is for their long time mental health. And it's not even close. So that if this didn't happen, and this guy, you know, went, got psychotic again, uh, or went through some of the previous scenarios, he has less of a chance of making a, a dent in his life uh, as time goes on. So, I, you know, for, that's, a, that's just one particular kind of a case. There's all kinds of other crises that this situation can, go, can, can help. Again, I think that we need a crisis, uh, we need a diversion center. It'd be better, much better to have a diversion center with these facility services beds. It's much better to have it all at one place so that the people know, like Robin was talking about a little bit, the people know that's where to go. And then eventually it's going to save money because then it's going to eventually, I think, that this is going to cut down on the, on the percentage of people with mental illness in jail also because you're not going to have the repeat people. So uh, now one of the things is, I uh, haven't done this for a while, some of us are getting a little bit impatient and uh, with, with, the, with the diversion center. And so I, I, I would like to request, I mean, let's make a decision or let's, you guys, make a decision. <laughs> Uh, on what to do about this and and uh, and how to go about it. So that concludes my remarks, and I thank you very much for letting me talk. And thank you, thank you, Dr. Dr. Ryan, thank you. For, for letting me. Uh, Dr. Ryan, Dr. Ryan, I got a question for you. Mm -hmm. You made a comment that uh, presently there are about a hundred detainees in the jail that are dealing with mental health issues. I didn't make that comment, I, Robin. I, said, did. I made that comment. Right. Um, our understanding is that over the last couple of years, there's been a steady percentage of about 36% of the detainees in our jail have some kind of mental illness. Sheriff, Sheriff Johnson, is a, does that sound about right, about 100 detainees? Yes, sir, maybe more than them. I'm just saying, we got, yeah, you know, like they said, I believe I run the, the state's biggest mental hospital, and that's the Alamance County Jail. And I honestly believe that we can save money if we'll go on and do that diversion center. And I know we've been kicking the can down the road for what, four or five years yes, yes. on something like this. And gentlemen, I just wish you could spend a day with my detention officers and you will see what what there is to see as far as mental health issues. And the sad thing is, when a person goes into crisis in that jail, they wind up hitting or hurting a detention officer or another inmate, and guess what? Judge Brown and the judges, he's carried over with a felony on his record, and he goes goes he goes to prison. Oh, yeah. Don't yeah. think I'm a bleeding heart liberal either. I'm telling. The reason for my question was I. In, in my recollection, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were only talking about 16 long-term beds in the Virgin Center, so that would only take less and, than 20%. And they're not long-term. Right, I mean, yeah, that's They're, they're like short-term. This is not a total, that's not a total fix, okay? But, but, but it, it's, it's, every little bit you can do along the way is going to help. Uh, it, 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 Every person you can help or every person you can keep out of the jail situation, that situation I talked about, is going to continue to help, I think. And, and uh, so it's not perfect. And oh, the, the idea for us is to get the, really, is to get the percentage down. That's what we really want to do. The diversion center should get the percentage of those people that the chair is talking about in jail down. We want it going down. I, I also am on the, the 
jail mental health detention center mental health uh, committee we have a committee to try to work on this uh, you know and try to get everything kind of straight that we do these things right and the people get the proper treatment it, in the in the detention center and if that happens a lot of times I think that also will uh, will, will prevent recidivism put it like that so 16 beds versus 100 inmates. I mean, how do you even start figuring out who's going to go where? Um, you, you, are you talking about the people in the, in the in detention center? T people in the detention center that need that kind of service. Well, when they get out of the detention center, they don't need crisis. What they need, it, they don't need a crisis situation. When they leave, they don't need that. What they need <clears throat> is a handoff from, in, from the jail actually a, almost a handoff and at times we talked about doing transportation for an appointment that day a handoff <clears throat> from that, that person to outpatient treatment do, do, do you understand what I'm saying and that and that if you do if we do that right if we do that right which we're, we're working on we got a peer person in there too that's, that's helpful with this okay. uh, and uh, uh, if we do that right, we're going to get the, pay, the pay person under treatment, and so that, that's an, another way. So we're bypassing, at, at this point, we're by, bypassing the, 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 t the crisis center. Dr. Ryan, we've been playing this. I was county commissioner in 2014. We were talking about it. Uh, I was, uh, we were talking about it earlier. Uh, we've talked about working with this group and that group and all kinds of things we keep putting it off and off and off i'm asking have, you to do now we have a proposal on the board right now that elements county our manager and our deputy uh, manager are, are working on a contract as we speak um, and we could be in that center potentially as early as the end of this year or we can continue to study it as we have since 2014 and maybe be in a center two to ten years from now or just continue to talk about it. Why should we go ahead and pull the trigger at this point? Pull the trigger? Okay. Pull, yeah, bad bad, and, bad no, term. No, no, yeah, it's fine with me. Go, yeah, go ahead and pull the trigger. I'm for, I'm for, you, for you pulling the trigger. Yeah, you know, if you do it at this point, you have more of a chance decreasing the jail population you have more of a chance of, 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 of helping these people like in my example uh, and you, you know you have more than a chance of helping a lot of different people uh, you know j just by just by u utilizing this and getting them into treatment and, and importantly getting them into treatment and keeping them there uh, and so so yeah pull the trigger now because I, I you know th th this mental health situation is is not I I don't think it's going to get any better right now I'm talking about general mental health problems you know this COVID has really uh, has has taken a toll it's taken a toll I can see it in my you know I have this little small practice I can see it there I can see it myself you know I mean it get more irritable you know and, and <laughs> we've already seen that the, the, the uh, domestic violence is, is going up yeah, have you ever have you driven between here and Raleigh lately? Anybody take that that road? I mean, you know, there's more drivers out there going 150 miles an hour than there ever were. I mean, I, I have a a son that lives there, and, and, and our traffic deaths are up. Overdoses, 40, two years ago, overdoses were 40,000, and we thought that was a pandemic, 40,000 a year. Now, overdoses are at 110,000 per year. So, so, you know, so I think so, some of the, uh, of the psychiatrists that are uh, into epidemiology, you know, think we're going to have a mental health crisis on our hands. And if we do, we're going to need everything we can get to, to, to try to help. And I, and I think this is, it, it is our, our best solution here. Well, Dr. Ryan, st statistically, if we had a divergence center and we were moving 16 patients over 14 days, I think that's the term, mm -hmm. through the process, would that have a tendency to get those 16 out of the system and eventually lower the number do we believe in the jail? 
Okay. Are, is that can jail going to be a long-term issue? Can I, can I help with this a little okay. bit? Because since I'm the one who brought up right, the other right, bit. So it's not, these, the, the beds in the jail are not substituting for hospital beds. But these are folks whose mental illness got them arrested right and they are serving and in fact one of our deputy sheriffs former deputy sheriffs used to call it you know they're serving life sentences 30 days at a time mm -hmm. they're they're serving you know 27 days 30 days 27 days 30 days that's who's clogging up the hundred beds in the jail so if we can get law enforcement to drop off someone we help that person get the, it, that doesn't need to be arrested and put in jail then we are um, we're making room in our jails for for offenders. That well, that's kind of where I'm trying to get. I'm yeah. trying to see what the light at the end of the tunnel actually looks like. Is it a lower number in the jail, or is that a, is that not really going to be a possibility? Or I, I, I think it's a, yeah, I think it's a lower number in the jail. Yeah, uh, what, that's what we that's part of our goal. We've that's established awesome. that as a goal. Awesome. To, to 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 lower. Sure, that would the, be a goal. The, the, the lower the recidivism rate. As and part of that answer, also, um, it's not only to get to keep them out of the jail and get them out of the court process and so forth and get them help, but it's also the diversion center would also be able to put them in long-term care if they needed that. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. If, if, I'm, I'm trying to be quiet. No, no you're not, Please Larry. Don't be quiet. <laughs> 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 Sir, I'm really trying. <laughs> The cost associated to someone whose house is broken into because an individual is suffering from a mental health crisis, I cannot give you a dollar sign sure. on what it would bring that person's life back because their house was broken into. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a prime example, and I can discuss this because the case is dealt with, is completed, but it happened and it's public. It was right in court. Just last week, a lady is in our side of our jail, Sheriff. She's going through first appearances. Her mother arrives because her mother just had to go and pick up a 13-year-old child, a two-year-old child, and a one-year-old child who allegedly had been left alone inside of the home because the mother was off of her medication. The mother is now in our jail because she allegedly went to a store and took, well, she, she pled responsible to the crime, and took food, a hot dog, and a soda. She's in mental crisis I'm sitting there now on the computer screen trying to figure all of this out in court. Her mother's like, judge, please tell me what to do. I don't know where to go. She needs help. And I turn around and you know what all I could do? All I could do while she began to yell at the officers inside of our jail, she then went subsequently spit on the officers and attacked the officers, because, allegedly, because she's in mental health crisis. The most I could do, Mr. Carter, Commissioner Carter, was order a forensic evaluation. <laughs> forensic evaluation, we had to call through the programs that we now have at the Sheriff's Office, we were able to get a forensic evaluation where usually it takes four to five days because they are so overwhelmed and understaffed. So we finally get the, the, the forensic evaluation and we had nowhere to send her for help because our jail is not a treatment facility. Sure. I can't give you a dollar sign for that, but I'm telling you, do we want to put the money on the front end or do we want to put the money on the back end? I am begging you all, please, if the, we need a diversion center here in Alamance County because people are in crisis. Our officers get a call, they are diverting some cases and we finally have that ability, but we still don't have a diversion center. Commissioner Carter, Commissioner Turner, Commissioner Lashley, Commissioner Thompson, Chair Paisley, 16 beds are better than nothing. Because right now, we have nothing. And mental health is a huge issue of concern that we all are aware of. If we, we had the diversion start. center in place today, what could you have done with her? I could have the jail, when inside of that crisis, the jail could have been, we can create a process where if that person is in need of help, they can then be transported by the, sh possibly by the sheriff or another, another because we have also another team through Miss um, Miss Amy that is able possibly to transport. But it probably, if they're in sheriff's custody, to take them straight to the um, the diversion center, then the officer does not have to sit there for 14 to 17 days 
because now they're in a safe, secure area receiving treatment for their mental health crisis. They can go through the process of up to 14 days, and then we will have staff there who are trained to say, okay, this individual now may need inpatient treatment. Let's contact the different agencies around the county, I mean, around the state, who may be able to divert them to an inpatient treatment facility. Because you tell a poor person when they're released, I want you to go to RHA in 24 hours. If I'm poor and I don't have a car, how am I going to get to RHA to get the help that I need? So I'm just saying to you, we would have the ability to then transport them from our jail, place them at the facility, they receive the treatment, 14 days, however number of days, and then possibly by di divert it to an inpatient treatment facility long term, or connect them to RHA outpatient treatment here with local services, because now they may have the shot and they may have received it, and now they're not up here, they're now at a manageable level. Do we need to wait two to four years and study this longer? Deny. <laughs> Thank you. Deny. You know, well, let, I, me, let me point out. I, I, I actually appreciate everyone in this room who is like, Sheriff Johnson, I understand you've been doing this for a long time. You've been wanting this diversion center for a long time. Yes, sir. And Judge, Judge Brown, I see the need. After me and Pam went over to, to, to the sheriffs and spent and went, took his invitation and came over to see the detention center. I I see the I, I just want I just want to say this because I see the need for this ex extremely well, but there is a reason why we're in this situation. Do you do you all know why? I think this lady back here mentioned it. You mentioned that the state of North Carolina got out of got 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 out of the uh, the business. Do we know why? I think everybody in this room knows why. You're just not willing to say it. It's expensive. I want to make this happen, but I'm not sure our taxpayers can afford it. I think you might be digging a hole in which my taxpayers can't fill it. Now, I hope that's not true, and I'll look every single day, I'll be with Pam, about how we can change this. We all want this to work. I do. But where are we going to get the money? Who's going to pay for it? And when, when, it, when the cost get, starts getting out of control, are you going to turn to the taxpayers and say, hey, we need money for this? You're going to have to. And I'm, I'm willing to solve this problem, to help you solve this problem. But I want you to understand that you're talking about tens of millions of dollars. I want to make this work. But I'm not certain our taxpayers can afford it. Now, we, can, we got $16 million from COVID we can throw in there to make it happen. But the price tag don't stop then. That's just when it gets started. Does anybody in this room know how much it costs to, uh, and I'm sure this, this gentleman and this lady up here do know, how much, how much does it cost? Mr. Lashley, let me address that too. We have Via on mm -hmm. Zoom, and I we also got a have question. I, I got a question for them. them uh, Are they going to be able to do it for a million dollars a year? Well, let's let them address that. Well, I'm just, that's my question for them. Can they do it for a million dollars a year? I think the number was a million four, but I'm not you sure. Well, you're skip you. It's going to be a whole lot more than a million dollars. All, right. All I'm saying is I want to do this, but I don't want to just throw caution into the wind just because we definitely need it. But come on, we have to make sure that we can pay for this. All right, we have the experts online right here. Hmm? Let's let them answer that. Excellent. Uh, not only you with Valia, why don't you address that initially? Sure, I appreciate that, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for allowing me to be with you. Wish I could be there uh, in person with you. I think the, uh, so the first the, tell everyone uh, who you are and, and who you represent and your position, please. Thank you for that. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Don Bruce, and I'm the Vice President of Behavioral Health and IDD Operations uh, for Via Health, and we recently. Um, began working with Alamance County as the local management uh, MCO. And we've uh, strategically have either built, renovated, and currently operate five such facilities like this uh, in North Carolina. And so part of the uh, planning around this particular facility uh, when we were asked to come into Alamance County was this was the number one priority uh, for behavioral health in Alamance County. And so when we looked at it, part of our planning was is not only how we could lift the facility, um, but then how can we operationalize the facility. 
Um, I think that Robin uh, Hoffman put it really well when she talked about area authorities. And so when you look at creating centers like this, it's really creating an area authority approach to where you're taking existing dollars that are in the system that are already being spent today and reappropriating them into the center. And so if you talk about the services that you know Robin um, and some of the others already talked to that you're already doing, it's taking those and consolidating those into a diversion center. You have a lot of the pieces already in there, but they're very fragmented and they're all across the county. That doesn't take new dollars to actually pull those into a center and get them working together. Mobile crisis, the extended urgent care uh, that you have with RHA, those dollars can be pulled uh, into those centers to create some of the services and supports. Uh, there's three there's lots of components of this, but three main buckets of funding that you need to know about. There's a 16-bed facility-based crisis uh, that you guys mentioned there. Uh, that's roughly going to cost about $2.5 million of operational costs. Uh, that would be a cost that BIO would be paying for out of Medicaid and state dollars. Uh, that would not be any additional costs uh, to the county. Uh, the Behavioral Health Urgent Care uh, is another program. You guys are already currently contributing. Uh, I think 1.2, and I'm Brian there, um, into the RHA extended um, uh, hours. We expect that those dollars can be pulled into the urgent care functions. That's your law enforcement drop off. Uh, they're already open uh, till 12 o'clock at night, as stated here. So putting some additional dollars into that program to get them 24 seven. The other outpatient based services are already being paid for by VIA in your community. Medicaid, state funds are already being paid for certain community treatment teams, mobile crisis services, other diversion services that are in there, vocational services like supportive employment, housing services to get people um, connected, but they're all fragmented. Our goal would be to take that existing dollar that we're already paying for, for providers and services and pulling that into the diversion center to get all of those services operational within the facility without <coughs> funds from the county other than the current maintenance of effort dollars that you're currently putting in which i think is a total of 1.4 billion dollars the county is already contributing and is set aside through maintenance of effort dollars uh, for the county um, so that's where our position is our request of the county was to help the actual the building and development of the building uh, that initial cost of of building a building consolidating that um, those take an upfront dollars and the fact that the county really is in a unique position with american reinvestment dollars opioid settlement dollars as well as the funding that um, that uh, cardinal put on the table and then the 500,000 that the uh, robin mentioned from the state general assembly really creates a an opportunity here where the funding exists to actually lift the facility and then get it operational uh, within the existing dollars that we have in the system. How much money, um, Mr. Lashley saying we cannot afford it. Did not say that. Uh, I apologize. Um, it suggested future, tell, tell him what you you asked the question. I was concerned that the future, prop, uh, the future cost of this program is gonna be astronomical. And you, uh, you and, and what you said about 1.4 versus 2.5, that's almost 100 percent. That's almost 100 percent higher in the first year. I'm concerned that we are going to dig ourselves a hole in which we are going to be. We are going to we are going to create this diversion center, and then it's going to cost us five six million dollars a year. You know, I got my salaries going up five million dollars this year. See what I'm saying, sir? Yeah, Thank you. I mean, you, you can make a diversion center as expensive or as I agree. less expensive and, and as sir, you I'm, want to make it. I'm looking at other diversion centers around the state as well, and I'm looking at their cost increases, how their cost is going up. And that's all I'm looking for. This, Judge Brown, I can't agree with you more. It, we need it. All I'm concerned about is can we afford it? And to buy a $2.5 million price tag is doable. It's doable. It is doable. I'm just concerned about going forward. It, that it could get out of control. Okay, now, I'm sorry. Because it did for the state of North Carolina. Sorry, Bill. I'm sorry, Steve. I was trying to listen, but I thought you said that about $2.5 was available from existing sources already, 
from state and federal dollars. Am I correct? Yeah, the $2.5 million for the facility-based crisis is dollars that VI is putting on the table through Medicaid and state dollars. We are not asking the county for those additional services. We're only asking for the county uh, to help with the startup of the facility, which is the construction, development of the facility, and then their ongoing maintenance of effort dollars that they're currently contributing and required to contribute per statute. And commissioners, the, the dollar amount the county is required to spend on mental health every year that Donald mentioned, our maintenance of effort money, these are funds that we're required by law, by statute, to spend on mental health services. It's 1203000 I can't remember the last couple of dollars. Uh, and we spend those every year. If we don't, we bank them. So we have some of those that are actually banked at this time. Uh, so we're currently spending a little over a million dollars a year on the level, uh, level of service we're receiving now at the Crisis Center on Anne Elizabeth Drive. But that also includes a grant we received from the federal government, a Bureau of Justice Administration grant through the Sheriff's Department that is helping to pay for the hour extensions that we've talked about. And I believe that's around the $200,000 uh, that Donald mentioned. So what we've talked with VIA about, one of the questions I've had for them was, could they assure the commissioners that this new diversion center built at this level with 16 beds uh, could it be done in a way that the county's contribution for annual ongoing operations would stay the same as its current dollar amount which is one million county dollars there is a two hundred thousand dollar grant uh federal grant that will run out in a couple of years and the county would have to figure out what to do about that but our our total dollar amount required by law and it's static every year to spend is 1.203 million just to let the commissioners know too besides the ARP dollars uh, I know uh, Donald mentioned this too we currently have a little over two million dollars in hand in fact we have two million eighty six thousand two hundred and sixty three dollars in our hands for one-time capital use for a diversion center uh, 1.2 million of that came from uh, the one-time grant that Cardinal Innovations gave to the county before they merged with VIA we also have the uh, recently approved half a million dollars from the state of North Carolina that was done through the budget. And then we have some banked MOE monies that were not spent. We had contracts that expired. Well, we have to track that money. So we have that money in a savings account. So that $2, two million is in our hands right now on top of ARP. That is not ARP dollars. Those are money specifically that could be used for capital for, uh, for a diversion center. So I think that is a very valid concern Mr. Lashley has is about you know if you go to this new model how can you assure the county that uh you know our current level of operational cost stays the same or very very close to the same and i think what i've heard from donald is their ability to use medicare funds and bring dollars that are already being spent in the community for mental health services to bear on paying for this new enhanced facility would be the way to do that. I, I do think the commissioners would be within their rights to, and, and well justified to ask Donald to share that with us in a little more formal way than we're doing here tonight, right? To see if the county keeps putting its million uh, two in, those, including the grant funds from the feds, what, what would uh, VIA actually put together? A package that says, this is what we think the operational costs would be and how they would cover the rest of it. So. Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may, uh, a, a comment quickly and then a suggestion on perhaps how to move forward uh, on this topic. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ryan and, and Ms. Huffman, I get the sense of urgency. I understand that we've been talking about this for five years and we don't have anything yet. I would just add that over the past six months, there's been a pretty big sea change in what's possible based on ARPA funding. And I think it was wise for us, uh, you know, we were building momentum in December to come to some kind of a, a idea what we did, what we would do. I think it's wise for us to have taken two months to pause, and I can tell you that we have not sat idle for the past, past two months. Um, I suggested that we, that we take a step back to consider funding sources, facility, and programming, and in the past two months, I think all of us have had numerous conversations uh, with um, potential partners, including Cone, including uh, RHA and VIA. Uh, and also different uh, facility, uh, five different facilities we've looked at around the hospital, um, so that we are sure that we're doing our due diligence for the county and, and determining what, what it is that we, that we actually move on. Um, I, I think the, the pause is, I, I think we have some good information and the pause has been wise. I think, Mr. Chairman, we've also created a subcommittee of commissioners. I think it might be good to put that into action 
in connection with VIA and in connection with some of our JAC partners to make a decision and perhaps a recommendation to this board, uh, if not the next meeting, then the following meeting, so that we have some kind of idea about how to move forward, particularly with facility. Uh, and then I think once we get facility going and have an idea of what that looks like, then once the facility is being built, that provides both a timeline and a structure to determine programming and partners to put into the facility. And so I think, I think that's how we move forward. Um, can I have yes, just a second about not bricks? No bricks. I'm not going to talk about bricks. Um, I had requested through, because I drag Bill everywhere. He's so accommodating. Thank you. Like my new brother. I'm sorry. But I'd ask Linda Allison if Bill and I could come and tour the pathway of diversion and speak to the officer that involves Steve Ginner, Chris and I, all these people. And, um, and, it, and I know we didn't see the real ugly, thank you, but I know what's in there. I mean, I'm there all the time speaking with clients. And uh, there's, there's a lot of damage in that building, and I just want us to understand that if they're not, and I'm 100% in support of this, but if they're not in the jail and we get them out of the jail and we take them through diversion, somebody's still going to be paying for this. It's not like all of a sudden there's this, you know, that COVID money flying across the sky. But that's just what our society is. That's what we're supposed to do is help each other because not everybody walks a straight line and, and doesn't have a horrible situation happen to them. But we ended up in court under Le Brown. And um, we were sitting there and on the fourth row on the, my face and left side of the courtroom was a young woman and she was dirty. Her hair was nasty. It was probably three inches longer on this side than that side because she probably cut it herself. She's wearing a uh, white t-shirt, a man's white t-shirt, and was just out of her mind. I watched her do this, and I thought, and Ashley Motley was chomping at the bit to help her. She, she was right on it with a crisis. She said, I got to talk to her, I got to talk to her, and she kept on. I thought, if she hits the back of that pew, she's going to break her nose. And whenever we went and spoke with Larry Brown, uh, Judge Brown, um, we sit there and we come out, she got a new court date, which means she's got 30 more days to use drugs and just destroy her life. And anybody that loves her, it goes into the family as well. And if she's got children, I don't know where they are. And um, what I'm trying to say is we've been talking about recovery court too. That's another one that's case management for people who are just heavily ridden. And newsflash, mental illness is mental illness. But drug addiction is its best friend and sister. And I, will, I can give you 90% of all the people I work with for drug addiction have had so much sexual trauma laid on them as children. And then the drugs walk into their life and they go, I'll make you forget everything if you just take me. So then you got trauma as a master and you've got a drug addiction as a master. And it's just over and over and over. You talk about recidivism. It's just, um, we've got guys and girls walking the street in Graham that get in trouble to get in jail to have three meals a day and somewhere to sleep because they're homeless. We, we're just, we're a hot mess. I mean, we just are. And we just watch the old fentanyl ferry just keep coming across the border and just killing our people because of drug addiction. And, um, and we're, we look at the wrong things sometimes. And, um, I, you know, I, I'm always trying to find somebody somewhere to take our clients. And, um, I give her a shout all the time. Krista Knight helps me daily with the women and the men, mostly women, to get into a treatment center. And this is another thing that you're going to have to think of. And Donald, I, you know where I'm going because I drive you crazy. Is diversion is awesome. It is the point of start. But where are we going to send these people? Because like Judge Brown said, you know, I want you to do outpatient therapy for three days. I want you to be there because I want to get your life together. And I'm going, well, I don't have nowhere to get there. I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do? Now I've got an excuse not to go. That's the mindset of this. It's almost a hand-holding process. Like with recovery courts all in Orange County, it is a hand-holding process. I wish you could see the pictures on my phone right now of three women that I've worked with in the last four months of their arrest booking shot and where they are now because they've been living in a treatment center totally wrapped around and just literally saved. They look like just models. They're unbelievable because you can see all that just awful come off of them, which is drugs and which is trauma and which is everything. If you haven't walked that, get on your knees and thank God because it is not something that you just get high with. People don't party anymore. They're owned by these drugs. They're owned by people that are, have them in servitude and anything else. So 
I, I'm supportive, you know. That, that's not the issue. The issue is where are they going next because there are not enough places to really treat this population in the way that they need to be treated. And if you don't have this in your family, you are so lucky. But I guarantee you know somebody that has this in your family because this is just like cancer. And the domestic violence shelter and the crossroads sexual abuse situation, this is all mental health because of what they've lived with and what they're going through. I had someone tell me when I used to work in family services, y'all's women in that shelter are crazy. When I get to doing this, I'm really getting mad. Y'all's women in that shelter are crazy. I said, you daggum right they're crazy because crazy has happened to them. And that is what we're dealing with. So commissioners, this is getting to be like the, the Udo, Hodo, whatever we was talking about a while ago. This is crazy because every day we don't do something, we're intentionally not doing something. And, and if it's my family, I want something done. If it's not my family, then I'm not going to mess with it because I cannot look at stuff and it's still there. And so if we want to be in denial, that's fine. And if it happens to your family, I don't want the rich and famous to have this to happen to them and all of a sudden this is important and it really matters because everybody matters. And you're talking about children, there's a new substance abuse program for kids under the age of 18. Now get JCPC in here and tell you about that. Because if you don't, get Todd Thorpe to tell you, if you don't think you've got kids suffering from drug abuse, trying to cope with what's going on in their homes, walking into our schools to have all kind of issues, wake up. We are in a crisis. When, when our crisis places are in a crisis, we are really in trouble. And we are there because I watched the news and I, what was it? There are almost over half fentanyl deaths for January than there was of all last year. So don't tell me it's not getting worse. And I mean, they're owning us. They are literally owning us and they're going to own our children. And oh, I'm just telling y'all, we. I, I would say something that you, if you don't blank, you get off the pot. But I'm going to be a really <laughs> fine person to not say that. Ms. But Thompson, we have got are, to go. You just took my right out of my mouth, ma'am. I've been on this my board My mother would pop years. my mouth if I said that right here. She <laughs> would. I've been on this board for four years, and we've been talking about this for four years. It's it's old news, and it's yeah. called, uh, I don't want to be the one that takes the plunge, but come on. You, you, now, leaders risk things, and we're going to risk this for the people in our county because they are dying. I've had five of our clients to die from overdose, and I love them. I work with them, but I wasn't enough, and we got to have enough. Got two questions. Sure? Question number one is, if we don't move on this now, and I don't mean today in this vote, but I'm talking about right next meeting, March whatever what's it going to cost us in one money if we don't move on it and question two is what's it going to cost us in lives and any of you folks can answer that question put plenty in lives put plenty you know i mean just like give us a number I, I have no i'm saying give us a number can't, please you can't, you can't, you can't quantify that just Sheriff please Johnson. think about one day instead of always having to find somewhere in Charlotte, in Lexington, in everywhere, I call all the time. Please think about having somewhere here for our own folks so they can be near their family and it can make a big difference working with the family unit. Mr. Chairman, the sheriff said he wanted to have a chance. You know, I, was li me. I was listening uh, to Pam a minute ago talking about, you know, what it's going to cost. Let me tell you something. Every day an inmate spends in that jail not counting the medical stuff we're having to give them to say is about eighty seven dollars right now a day so if we can stop them from being in that jail and believe me the frequent flyers that's what i refer to them is is in jail you they get out they come back why because of mental you know mental health issues if we can get just a few of them Going the right way, we're going to save money because it, $87 just counts the food, the air conditioning, whatever. Then you have the medications that we have to give these individuals in the jail. So that's there's a money on this million. end, but there's also a money on this end. Do what? Sir? That's conservatively about $3 million right there. And, you know, if we don't do something, uh, I think we're passing up one of the greatest challenges that we face is public officials and if we don't do something and this is the way i feel 
we are just as guilty as people as violated law wound up in the jail. Guilty because they are the human beings. How do you put a price on a human being's life sure. that we know that we could possibly make a difference to make them an a viable citizen uh, to gain their life back? Sure. And I see it every day in that jail. And I know money is, is an issue, and I agree with you. I'm just I'm trying to be right. the voice of reason. I'm just saying, say, hey, hey, no. look at this. No. I'm not saying no. I, I I'm saying, understand. hey, look at this. I just and, want you to look at this. And you know what? I admire you for looking at the taxpayers' dollars because that's who you work for, yes, and sir. that's who I work for. But I'm, I'm telling you, my 51 years in this business, uh, the state dumped it on the local uh, counties. They knew what they were doing. Amen. Sure. They knew what they were doing. And guess what? We, at that time when it was done, was not ready to step up where we should have been stepping up to help counter some of this stuff. We're trying to do that now here in Alamance County. And believe me, it's, it's not an easy task for nobody yeah. in this thing. But I'm asking you to, you know, to look at it. Look at it hard. I'll live whatever decision you folks make. But I'm telling you this, there is a need in this county. There is a need all over this state. And hopefully some people will follow the patterns that y'all have set here in Alamance County. Thank you. I got Thank a you. question for Mr. Haygood. Um, I had a person call me today and they said that the facility that was under discussion would not be finished. It would be a hall. And then after we bought it, we would then have to finish it. Is that correct? I think uh, one of the models that we've looked at, because we've looked at a lot of ways to do diversion, everything from right. where they currently are uh, doing the limited amount that we have on Anne Elizabeth Drive to the elderly services building. One of the models that we've looked at was to partner with a local developer and uh, have the building constructed and then uh, also pay to upfit, uh, upfit the building because there are uh, specific amenities that would need to go inside of the building. So, you know, I think the one thing that has really changed this discussion has been the um, uh, allocation of art dollars for the county. We, we, we never had access to $30 million before to even consider for this. We were trying to operate within uh, uh, the million dollars that we had from um, Cardinal, right? So if, if the commissioners uh, decide that you want to allocate art dollars, which our understanding from final guidance is that it is possible to use for this purpose and you're able to work with VIA to assure that this new 16 bed enhanced facility could also be operated with the amount of dollars that you're already putting in right now for the crisis center that exists today. Uh, that's a pretty good model and you just have to come to a conclusion about do you feel comfortable allocating the art dollars. So well, what's the bottom line on the cost to get a complete facility for the 16 beds? Have we got a number yet? So we, we had an estimate at one point uh, of $13.5 million that was construction and upfit, uh, but I think we've looked at multiple models for that too. So, you know, uh, the county has uh, a significant amount of ARB dollars and, and lots of possible ways to spend it. Um, you know, I think uh, that's a reasonable amount to consider. I know we've, as I say, we've looked at other locations, other possibilities, but that's, that's the one number that we have. Hands. Okay, I must have missed that. I'm sorry. I didn't hear uh, Thirteen and a half million 13 has been the, million, the okay. most recent estimate to construct a facility. I think it was around twenty thousand square feet, roughly, I believe, and uh, and also to upfit it. So that is like a total estimated cost. Now, are we in the same boat we've been talking about with the jail? I'm oh, not the jail. Excuse me, the court building. You know, the question we were dealing with there was we built it in the past, and when it was opened, it wasn't big enough. Are we at risk of getting in this situation where we build it? It's not big enough, and we've got to turn around and look at it again. I mean, th let me answer that question. I know that we're looking at multiple contracts or multiple possibilities at this point, and that's why the uh, 19,000 square feet may be expanded, and we're looking at different numbers as I've heard we that, speak. Right. Mr. Chairman, so, I have a motion. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please, go ahead. Uh, I move that the steering committee of this board, can, it's consisting of the chair and Ms. Thompson, who have been already been designated, meet with staff, VIA, and designated members of the JAC committee to come up with a recommendation regarding facility to move forward with diversion and report back with a recommendation 
no later than the second meeting uh, in March. I'll second that. But do we need to actually state in this meeting that we support this and we want this? Are we going to next meeting, next meeting? I, I don't want to be at Twin Lakes that. and taking the bus to come here. I think the motion does that, but I could be wrong. Okay. I'm of the opinion it, it does as well. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion about the motion? <clears throat> All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Turner, thank you. Thank you. It's a good motion, correct. Mr. Um, Haygood and Ms. Hook, both deputy county manager and county manager, um, if you, along with uh, someone that we're working with currently on the project and so forth, can get us numbers, I know that this week is going to be jammed with what's going on. I've seen the docket. Um, but if you can get back with us early next week, possibly with some numbers uh, for both the 19,000 and then the expansion, I would be very appreciative and our subcommittee would be very appreciative. And we'll begin to work with uh, you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Thompson, uh, with Donald, and uh, I think Robin and uh, Dr. Ryan are uh, the folks that have been uh, blessed by Jack to participate with this committee. So we will be sure and get with both of you and set up a date to get all of us together as soon as possible. So uh, we'll, and we'll get this conversation started and be back uh, as quickly as possible to the commission. And to be clear, Mr. Chairman, the motion was for a steering committee, not a subcommittee, which I understand has a little I apologize. It's steering committees, I'm correct. Yes, yes. Thank you. We got some committees. All right, we're mm -hmm. going to take a 10-minute uh, break at this point. We're back in session. Okay, uh, Mr. Haygood, we're going to recognize you for the LMS Burlington School System. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, the next item on your agenda is a request from the LMS Burlington School System. Uh, the request is to allocate $8,482,222.50 from the school system's capital reserve. This is for specific repair and security projects. This item does require a vote in order to uh, implement a budget amendment that is in your packet. I'm going to go through a, a brief presentation about these projects. Uh, and we also have Dr. Thorpe uh, from Alvin Thorpe School System with us uh, this evening to answer any questions as we go through. So uh, the commissioners are well aware that the school system has created a top 10 unfunded list. This is a list of projects that are not funded by education bond uh, proceeds or by their annual PAYGO. So they have uh, done that at the request of the commissioners and their board. The total estimated amount for the top 10 unfunded project list for the school system is $11.1 million. Uh, the school system has also prepared a list of needed security projects, middle school camera and door projects that's included uh, in your packet. It's been estimated uh, to cost half a million dollars. These projects and all this discussion uh, and the possibility of doing these capital projects has been reviewed by the Technical Review Committee, which as the board will remember, is made up of uh, staff from Allen's Burlington the School System, the Community College, and the County, as well as the Capital Oversight Committee, which uh, Chair Paisley and Vice Chair Carter sit on along with representatives from the school board and the Board of Trustees from the college, as well as the County Commissioners. At our last meeting, uh, the school system came and talked with you about the projects that they would like to do. and this list entails those projects. Uh, they are all from the top 10 list with the exception of the middle school security projects, but uh, these include the roof at Hall River Elementary School, masonry work at Hall River Elementary, uh, high school roof replacement at Graham and at Southern High School, as well as three traffic related projects. The commissioners will recall uh, there were traffic related projects proposed to be done at AO Elementary, Alexander Wilson Elementary, and E.M. Holt Elementary. So all those projects from the top 10 unfunded list as well as the middle school security uh, projects uh, total the $8.4 million that would be paid from the school system's capital reserve. So again, the total request for capital reserve funds, these are funds that are in the school system's capital reserve account, $8,482,222.50. Currently, the school system has available in its capital reserve $12,718,754. And the county staff believe that by the end of this fiscal year, based on the way uh, sales tax revenue is coming in at this time, 
we will add approximately $3.2 million to ABSS capital reserve this year above and beyond what the financing plan calls for uh, to make sure we are able to pay the school system's debt service as well as their $3.3 million annual pay go. So that, that $3.2 million, understand commissioners, is above and beyond what the plan calls for, so it would be added to capital reserve, taking their total available capital reserve to almost $16 million. We believe there are adequate capital reserve for this pro these projects. If the commissioners approve using this $8.4 million, it will still leave a significant amount of money in their capital reserve account uh, for either emergencies or possibly other projects in the future, as well as the fact that the three uh, traffic projects at AO, Alexander Wilson and EM Holt, uh, the school system has talked with North Carolina Department of Transportation and uh, believe that these will be able to be reimbursed by the Department of Transportation. Those total dollar amounts for those projects alone are estimated to be $1,362,500. Uh, what we would suggest to the commissioners is, as we did with the last traffic projects, if you vote to do this this evening and approve this budget amendment, uh, it would be appropriate to vote to allocate those funds when they are reimbursed from DOT back into the school system's capital reserve to be used for another project. So, uh, that's the extent of the, of the information about the school system's request. As I said, we have uh, Dr. Thorpe here to answer any questions. If you are interested in doing this uh, project or allowing the school system to have access to these funds, it does require a vote. The budget amendment is in the packet uh, for your consideration. So at this time, I'm happy to answer questions. Andrew's prepared to help uh, answer questions, and Dr. Thorpe is as well. So. Dr. Thorpe, would you, be, uh, would you be willing to repeat the comment you made about potential savings? I think you said you might have found some savings. Like with uh, all our roofing projects and stuff, we work to get the best number. Woodlawn just came in, and it's about 400000 under what we had budgeted. So, we, you know, of course, we'll take this and work the same way to bring it under budget as much as we can as well. And commissioners, if you approve these, this capital, uh, this budget amendment for these capital reserves to be used, if the school system does not require those funds, they will be able to revert back to the school system's capital reserve. So if Dr. Forbes is able to get a great deal, a better a better cost than what's projected here, the, the funding would stay in capital reserve. This would set the budget for these projects at a not to exceed, hopefully to come under. Correct. Mr. Haygood, can the funds in ABSS capital reserve account be used for anything other than ABSS capital? No, sir. They, right. they must be used for ABSS capital. Mr. Chairman, I have a motion that we approve ABSS's capital project request $8,482,222.50 with an appropriate budget amendment. I'll second. Sir. I just have one question, and it's an accounting question. Is that from capital fund? <laughs> from capital ABSS capital reserves. Thank you. Is that your second as well? Thank you. I just want to ask Mr. Haygood a question. Uh, just looking at your numbers here, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm on the right page. You said the capital reserve fund, as we sit right now, is twelve point seven million. Yes, that is the dollar amount that is available to be spent. Okay. So, so basically, I'm just going to walk, walk through some math here. I'm going to subtract 8.48 million. That's going to give you a balance of 4.230. I was going to ask Mr. Thorpe if that's good with him. If he, he's you're okay with that yes. balance? I well, I think, you think you might be because if, if uh, 3.2 comes right. in, you're going to be back at that five million we talked yes, about. Yes, sir. Before, so. Yes, sir. And I think I added 3.2. It gives us almost seven and a half. Yes. Sir. And you're good with that. Yes, sir. Cool deal. You know, Dr. Thorpe, it looks like between the bond and all this, ABSS is going to be pretty at every school. Yes, ma'am. Our goal is to make every school the best we can for our kids and for our community because you know, I'll be gone for long, no. but uh, <laughs> all the kids will be in this building. Are you moving to Wayne's Hole? Just be a little bit clearer oh. about what you mean when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> I may because there's some great fishing up there. So. <laughs> yeah. We you know a place you there. can go stay, right, yeah. dude? Right there. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thorpe. I know how hard you work. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Good, I think you're next again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the, the next item on the commissioner's agenda is a capital request from Alamance Community College. Uh, the, the college is requesting that uh, we allocate $2,500,000 from ACC's capital reserve, as well as the college is requesting that the commissioners consider issuing 
$2,998,930 in premium bond debt from the sale of bonds for the education bond projects at the college from the April 2021 sale. In order to do this, uh, the board would need to have two votes. One, to vote to approve the included capital project ordinance that is in your package. So there's a capital project ordinance in your package with the, with the budgets for each project and vote to approve a budget amendment for the use of capital reserves. One thing I think you'll note, and I'll make sure it's clear to the, uh, the, the community college staff, the, the request for capital reserves is a little bit different than the uh, $2,403,000, and it's a little bit less bond premium. And I'll talk about this, but I want to make sure that was clear. Uh, we want to make sure that there is bond premium left. If the commissioners decide to use bond premium tonight, which is not a foregone conclusion, but if, if you did, uh, our thought staff-wise was you doing it this way instead of the 2403 and the full amount of bond premium would leave some bond premium from April 2021 sale to be able to use uh, for bond issuance costs. So it, it could go either way, but in our opinion, this would leave some premium if the commissioners go this route. So I'm going to go through a uh, presentation. This is, I've had, I have struggled commissioners keeping my mind around all that we are talking about with the options and how this money would work. So I've tried to come up with, with Andrea's help, a table that demonstrates what's going on in this request and, and what's happening with the college's projects. So I hope you've had a chance to review this and I'm going to try to walk through it just to make sure you and the listening public understand what's going on. So in this table, the far right uh, column is all of the bond projects uh, for the community college. So the Center of Excellence, Student Service Center, Public Safety Training Center, Main Pile G renovation, and the two satellite projects. We also have included bond costs uh, uh, for the first bond issuance. So the second column, original budget, that is the budgets for the education bond projects for ACC as we originally thought they would be uh, before uh, the college got into actually doing the project. So that's the original budgets. They total up to $39.6 million. It's a little higher because we have included the bond cost uh, that we used premium to pay for uh, from the April issuance. So then in the third column, the one titled amended or proposed budget, these are budgets that the college has either already come to the commissioners and asked for approval to increase. Those would include the Center of Excellence and the Student Service Center. So I believe it was in August of 2021, the college came to the commissioners and said, we, we need to use additional funds for these two projects. So the board voted to set the budget for those two projects at the $19.4 million level and the $6.7 million level and at the same time voted to set the budget for the Public Safety Training Center at 10,400,000. So those three budgets are actually set, right? They are the only three project budgets that, that are set. Uh, so in that column, amended or proposed budget, the, the new uh, budget that the college is seeing for Public Safety Training Center is 12.9 million. Uh, the new budget that is being proposed uh, and seen by the college for Main Pile G is $5,035,000 and the two satellite budgets remain at half a million dollars. Then the total project cost change. So this is uh, just the difference between the two columns, a, a little over a $1.9 million cost increase for the Center of Excellence, a little over a half a million dollar cost increase for the Student Services Center, a $2.5 million increase in the budgetary needs for the Public Safety Training Center, and $595,000 uh, uh, cost increase for main pile G and at this point no no cost increases for satellite east or satellite west so in your packet you have a budget amendment and this is just this is the logistical details uh, those are the budget amendment dollar amounts for each one of these projects if the commissioners go forward with uh, approving these budgets for these projects and this slide demonstrates another table that shows where the funding would come from to, to pay for this. I think this is the important part for the commissioners to think about too. This is showing where uh, the, the uh, uh, funding would come from. So uh, on the, the far right, the amended or proposed budget, that's the new budgets, right? For, for each one of these projects based on, uh, it's either been amended by the Board of Commissioners or the college is saying these are the budgets that we need to do these projects due to cost increases. So in the first column, April 2021 original debt issuance, th these are the dollars that have been allocated for these projects from our first bond sale for the college back in April of 2021. So we issued 
thousand dollars in bond debt in April 2021, and that's how it was allocated: 17 and a half million for the Center of Excellence, and 16.2 for the Student Services. So, uh, and we we did use in April 2021, we used 70, almost 75 thousand dollars in bond premium. The board approved the use of bond premium at that time only to cover uh, debt issuance costs. So, we did use bond premium, but it was strictly for uh, the debt issuance costs of the April 2021 uh, debt issuance. So in the column titled September 22nd, the original debt issuance, this is back to the idea of $39.6 million uh, cash for education bond projects at the community college. So in September of 22, that's our next debt issuance. That's when we are planning to issue debt for Alamance Community College for their bond project. You would issue the uh, bond debt in this manner, 1.9 million more for student, uh, Center of Excellence, excuse me, a little over half a million new dollars for uh, Student Services Center, $10,400,000 for Public Safety Training Center, and then three million, a little over $3 million for Maine Powell G, total being $15,840,000. So if you add those, that, 15.8 to the 23.7, you come up with a 39.6. That was the original amount of the uh, project uh, budget, the overall project budget for uh, the community college's bond debt. However, community college has indicated that they are not going to be able to do their projects for $39.6 million and have suggested two ways for the uh, uh, commissioners to consider funding the uh, uh, new budgets for these projects. In the, in the September 20. 22 bond premium debt issuance. This would be the commissioners in September of 2022 issued bond premium debt from the original bond issuance in April of 2021. So in April of 2021, we had, it was $3,095,000 worth of bond premium debt that we didn't take advantage of. It's still on the table. The college is suggesting that we should consider using almost 2 million, the 1998930 in bond premium debt for Maine Powell G and then $500,000 in bond premium debt for Satellite East and Satellite West. Total amount of bond premium debt, premium from the April 2021 sale, $2,998,930. And then uh, in the use of ACC capital reserve column, the suggestion would be to use $2.5 million in ACC's capital reserve to supplement the budget for the Public Safety Training Center. And again, that last column shows you how all how you how all of this would add up to give you the new amended uh, budgets for each one of the community colleges um, uh, education bond project. So something to things to think about from the capital request from the community college in this model, it, it uses two point nine million of a little over three million dollars in bond premium debt that came from April 2021. Right. So we have $3,095,000 of unissued bond premium from last April that this proposal would use $2.9 million of. It also makes use of $2.5 million of an available $3,192,371 in the college's capital reserve. So the college has $3.1 million in capital reserve. They have more than that, but some of that has to be used for future debt service and for their future pay go. So this is the dollar amount that's available for the college at this point. This request would use two and a half million dollars of it. Something to think about. This is where we get a little bit of a difference from the college's original scenario one and what's before you today. We will have bond issuance costs again in September of 2022. And I would suggest the commissioners think about doing the same thing we did last time, using bond premium to pay those issuance costs. We feel pretty certain there will be bond premium again in September of 22. I can't guarantee that. Who knows what would happen? We believe that it will be bond premium again, but having some bond premium uh, in hand to pay those closing costs would be good. And it's important to recognize that we've got three million, a little over $3 million in unissued bond premium now uh, from April's bond sale. We have had estimates of another potential $2 million in bond premium that we could realize in September. That is not a guarantee. Lots of things could happen between now and when we get into September, but that is a possibility too. So uh, I, I hope that this has been clear to the commissioners, uh, kind of how the money would flow in this proposal, this request from the college. I'm certainly happy to try to answer any questions. Again, Andrea can help me answer these questions. And we have all the staff here, Dr. Gatewood and all of his folks here from the community college that can speak 
uh, to this project. Now we also have uh, Ms. McCollum from the town of Greenwell. We're very happy to have you here Thank too, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Good. We also have General Williams and son of the Forest mm -hmm. Board members. Indeed. Yes. Glad to have you gentlemen here with us this evening too. So. I think uh, there's lots of folks here that are happy to try to answer questions. And I, I will say that I believe the, the college is at a point, we've had this discussion at uh, TRC and at OSC, I think it's important that the college gets guidance tonight, if possible, for the Public Safety Training Center and the uh, G Renovation Building. I, I, our discussions with college staff have indicated they are at a point where they need to know the, the budget, how to move forward on Public Safety Training Center, and particularly on May Pile G, and that uh, they're at a point where they have incurred costs. If the board, depending on what the board does, there would be enough of the original 39.6 to at least pay for those costs, but they need to know uh, whether or not they can move forward with that project. So, gentlemen, I'm happy to, to turn the podium off over to you if you'd like to speak to anything that I've said, and uh, uh, same thing with the rest of the folks that are here. Yeah. Um, good, evening. good evening, Chair Paisley, members of the commission. I think, well, I know that Mr. Haygood presented the information and our current status much, much better than I could. So what he has presented is exactly what we would like for you to consider. It is exactly the direction in which we need to follow. And he is correct that we need to have a decision so that we'll know how to move forward. We are incurring expenses with the design work for the Public Safety Training Center and for the design work for those projects on campus at the same time. So that's our request. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gabe Wood. Thank so, you. <clears throat> commissioners, at this time, I'm happy to try to answer questions. And uh, as I say, we have, we have lots of folks here that will try to answer any questions that you have. Mr. Uh, just a quick question um, about uh, the budget for the public training, the public safety training center includes uh, a line item for water sewer to the facility. Is that right? Yes. yes Do we sir. know how what how much that is budgeted for? I believe uh, we had estimated four to five hundred thousand dollars in water sewer. Do you think, uh, gentlemen? Do you think is five hundred thousand dollars a reasonable cap to think that that might be or? Uh, that, yeah, that's what we know right now in terms of the um, uh, rough order of magnitude costs. What was the number? Half a million dollars would be the, the estimated cap for that for that project. Uh, at our last meeting, uh, the Mayor Green Level here, the, the uh, county uh, the city manager for, for Green Level was here. We discussed water sewer. I mean, I, to me, that's an economic development project for the town of Green Level that we could partner with uh, the town for a connection with their water sewer. And if we're digging a ditch for water sewer, we also ought to consider broadband anytime we're digging a ditch. And that we and that the county really look at um, that as an ARPA project and take that out of ACC's budget. I think that's I think that's more uh, in line with uh, with what the county needs on that. Um, so I think that that could help. Secondly, um, my there's not a motion on the on the floor, but my 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 thinking is the. Um, the $2.5 million for the Public Training Safety Center has, has got to be done. I don't think we can do that facility without that additional funding. Um, that's in ACC's capital reserves. If we allocate that, we're treating ABSS and ACC the same. Uh, I think, you know, I had mentioned at a, pre a previous meeting that uh, I would not be supporting additional debt service for ACC's bond requirements, and, and I'm still there. But that I think if we if we take the five hundred thousand dollars out and give them two point five million, there's a lot that ACC can do, and that's sort of like a scenario two plus. It doesn't get them everything they want, but it gets them a lot of what they what they ask for, all the way down to the uh, some improvements to the uh, the library. They would lose I think about six hundred thousand dollars in the library request. That's where I am, and that's where I think the board should be. Are you making a motion? Hold it. Can yeah. I just ask a question oh, before y'all do you vote yeah. stuff? Um, this unissued bond premium, is that is that over what the county folks voted on? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the county <laughs> citizenry voted to authorize the commissioners to issue $39.6 million mm -hmm. worth of bond debt for the school system. When it came time to issue the debt, we were able to get a little over $3, point, uh, $3 million in additional funding. It isn't free money. 
uh, as has been said repeatedly, the county does have the debt service dollar amount in the financial plan simply because we had we had fixed the plan in such a way that we thought we could afford $39.6 million at the original budget. <clears throat> so if you, if you voted to use premium uh, to the tune of $3 million, you would be given the college uh, $3 million additional to the uh, original $39.6 million. So that additional is not what was voted on. At, at, the, at the polling stations when you went to vote, that is not what the public voted for. Anything over that amount, or if it's a dollar or if it's a gazillion dollars. That's just what I'm asking. So I think ballot language was $39.6 million for uh, uh, the community college and $150 million for the school system. Mm -hmm. Again, it is legal to issue yeah. this debt. It, it is not what was on the ballot, $39.6 million was. Okay, I'm just curious. It's kind of like a mortgage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would, if you go out to, get a mortgage you say you want to you think you can buy a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house because you can make the payments on a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house you can't find one of those now yeah but if you could <laughs> um and the rates go down all of a sudden you find out the payments on your rates will get you a two hundred thousand dollar <coughs> house yep. well what, what what we're benefiting from is a reduction in the debt service cost because we're getting a lower interest rate <coughs> so lower, that lower interest rate we're, mm -hmm. You're right. not going to get a lower interest lower rate next time you go to the bond debt. Lower next time you go to the bond house, you wait and see what that interest rate is. I bet you it's double. I'm just saying. I'm just. Th this is just an <laughs> illustration. Yes, sir. Bill. Yes, sir. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Bond machine over here. Yeah, I'm just saying that it, with a lower rate, you can get a lower payment, or you can borrow more money at what you thought you could pay in the first place and get more house. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. I mean, we're still paying the same dollars in debt service, we're, but we're borrowing more money. Well, that's that. That brings me back to my point. Yeah, I, I mean, have a feeling that when we go to the bond market, I called them today, and I ain't going to tell you what the interest rate is, but it sure ain't 1.43 like we got a year ago. Right. I think it's almost double. Really? Look at the 20-year Treasury note. Damn things up above two to two percent. That's why you see the stock market kicking the kicking the pants out. But anyway, I digress. Um, well, that could mean the premium isn't out there. No, it's not. That's why I'm saying it's like you know. Uh, I think what Mr. Haygood said is is a very good thing to say as a caveat because I called the bond market last week. I got guys. I got friends that work in the bond market, and uh, they just asked me how much you coming with because people have backed up from the bond market. <laughs> Because what's happening is bond prices are going up and the rate's going down. So they can't afford the price of the bonds. So he was telling me that I maybe not, don't be looking to get as much premium from folks as we did before. But there's a caveat to that. They pulled up our financials for our county and we look pretty good. Yep. So that's why he said, if you come to the bond market, you will get some premium based on your financials, but don't expect to get as much as you did last time. And it makes sense. If the price goes up, it makes sense that you wouldn't get as much premium. And I do have one other question, and I'll go away. And I think Mr. Sheriff can answer this question. Uh, I just w I, I was just doing some some figuring uh, this weekend. Yes. And I wanted to see if you could provide me with the BLE BLET enrollments for 2019, 2020, and 2021. I do. I got it right here. Excellent. <laughs> I, I, I chose the right yeah. question. The uh, BLET enrollment for 2019 unduplicated headcount is 8,845. That's unduplicated headcount. For 2020, the unduplicated headcount was 4,278 COVID. And for 21, it's back up to 4,710. With the new training center, the enrollment is projected to be. Um, close to 9,000. So are these, these, these numbers, are they from all over the state? That's or Alamance here. County? Yes, yes, here. Yes, so why aren't we able to hire them? I mean, because we're always short. And I mean, I'm watching, I mean, what, what's, where are they going? Well, that's an unduplicated headcount. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So that, you know what that means. And I would suspect that most of the basic law enforcement 
personnel in this county was trained by Alamance Community College. Well, that's, that's, and that's awesome. What I'm trying to say is when we're short with detention and we're short in the sheriff's numbers and the Burlington <coughs> PD is short, everybody's short. So if we're training all these folks, are they just going out of county to work for various law enforcement agencies or are they like probation, criminal justice, or that kind now, of stuff? They, they run BLA program a certain time of the year okay. when you can get the program full. What's going to happen here if that regional training center opens up? They're going to be coming from Durham here because they only run BLAT training so much, so many times a year. So they'll send them. If we have a BLAT here and it's not full, we take people from out of county. If it is full, they can't. And with this training center, they're going to come in here like you've never seen. Take my word off. Well, I know. I think I said at the last meeting when I took the FBI Citizens Academy, don't worry, I'm not in the FBI. <laughs> um, that Undercover. they had theirs at Wave Tech, and it was loaded. There's a bunch of men and women out there. It was just absolutely awesome. And I, and, I mean, we, I just can't praise law enforcement enough because without them, we don't have a chance in this world. And so I was just curious, and, and to talk about the shooting range thing, um, another scare tactic, I'm getting my carrying concealed Saturday, so stay home and lock your doors. <laughs> but I'm just curious, like I'm going to Family Traditions on yes, 49. On oh 49. my gosh, it's absolutely beautiful. And they got a bunch <coughs> of the things where you shoot, you know, and that, it was just amazing. Do we ever use them or local gun ranges to put money back into them? Or do we just absolutely have to have our own? I'm just asking because okay. I don't know. Let, let me say this. I'm, I know Chapel Hill comes down to that range mm -hmm. to qualify. But that range stays busy with our local right. uh, you know, hunters and stuff. You can't get in there hardly. Right. And But Chapel Hill sends there. And guess where they're going to send them before you open up our room train? Right here. Okay. I'm just asking because no, yeah. this and ain't I, my and gift. I and question. I just need to be taught. That's all. I understand. I think that's great questions. Stop shot a gun, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> you should right. be scared. But the screen now you're getting <laughs> carrying <to it. laughs> The numbers are not for BLET. That's to, we, we don't train that many BLET <laughs> in a year. I think that's what Pam was asking. I'm thinking, are that, is not, that the we're career? We're seeing 4,000 candidates in a year here for BLET. Yeah. So just to clarify, that's Because like Greg Holt is a probation officer. Would he have to go through that to be a probation officer? Can I help on this? Yeah, because I just need to know. We um, we do a lot of mandated training for law enforcement agencies, and, and what uh, and I give Dr. Gay probably the wrong numbers. I, I take the blame for that because I, I include the law enforcement. We do we do detention officer. Gotcha. We do base uh, law enforcement officer, but we do mandated training. A police officer has to take at least 40 hours a year of training to become state. Uh, Certified in their, their in their field. So it's just not the one time. No, because yeah. one officer may come back several times. And you're correct. We did get a lot of people. We we had a, a class. We ran a class for we talked about mental health earlier. We ran a class last year for uh, mental health with the law enforcement officers. We had regional people come in. We need this facility because not only for our police officers and we're training. As you said earlier, a lot of our military officers go into the county. Mm -hmm. In fact, the sheriff hires and Burlington hires and Graham hires them before they even get into the program. We can't get enough people going into the, the business at this time. But we do need this facility. We need the classroom space. We, you talked about earlier, uh, Chairman, about if you're going to build it, build it right the first time. And we need, and that's what I'm asking for. I, I'm not going to be here for you forever, like Todd said, but. We do own a, see a good quality training center built for this county. The citizens deserve the police. The sheriff and, um, and uh, Ryan and Dr. Gatewood and Ms. McCollum, we've been talking about this for five years. We went out to visit sites. It, it's needed for this county. Uh, the driving pad, the fire departments need, uh, they need firefighters, EMS, all the public safety need employees. And we're providing a quality service here. And I think the sheriff will say this, I'm prejudiced in saying this, but I think we have one of the best LAT programs in the state. No in doubt fact, in my mind. the altar came here the other day, and he was from the mountains, and he said, I heard about this program long before I got here. And that made me take some pride in what I'm saying because he talked about how good we were. Chapel Hill, yes, Chapel Hill sends our people here. We've had people off from Durham, we get people from Rockingham County coming to our program. We provide a good service. 
and we not only train billing people, but they come back for mandated training for firearms, for driving, for other things. And I'm asking not just for me, but for the citizens of this county, let's build this thing and build it right. When you say they all come here to train, where do they shoot? We have, now we're using Boggs Ranch in the, the yeah, training yeah. center of Burlington. But we, we're talking about building a sophisticated indoor training facility that would help quieten the noise down for the community. It would provide better training. We can train. An officer has to train for day and night in this facility. And with the indoor facility, we can change the lights. We can even drive a car in there and emulate where they had to come up to the scene mm -hmm. to protect the officer. And a lot of this we do because they hope they never had to use this training. But if they do get in that situation, they can react rather than have to think about what they're going to. And I used to coach ball, and that's what I taught players how to do things before a situation happens so you can react. I can th if there's a runner on first, where well, I go with the ball. If there's a, a guy with a gun on me and I pull up in the car, where I react, where I say, where I'm, I'm safe at, where's my partner safe at? And that's what we're looking for. And uh, I apologize, maybe give Dr. Gate with the wrong numbers. I, I take the blame of that, but. All right, Gary. Are you looking? <laughs> <laughs> Are you moving to Waynesville? <laughs> <laughs> I might have to. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, we train that many people over a year in time who are mandated training or ability. The numbers at that part is correct. Got a but question for you. We want to do a good thing with it. Yes, sir. You I'm, I'm sorry, I thought you were me. finished. I'm finished. Okay. Uh, I think there's a training center in Sanford. Is that correct? No. There's a driving track in Sanford. A driving track. Yeah. There are, are there other, two other training centers in it's the state? There's a state training center. One is in... Uh, They're uh, using Semarcan now down in Moore County and the Justice Academy in... Uh, Salemburg. And, and where's the other one? In the mountains. Up in the mountains? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a long way to travel. Yeah, it is. Brian's going to be the police chief in Waynesville. <laughs> 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 I ain't figuring it out. Uh, he's mm -hmm. retired. I'd like to say something else too. He has been able to bring, uh, I know there's Robert Amati is getting ready to do a cartel school, one of the sharpest individuals from Texas, and they ran one a couple years ago, and it was packed with people from everywhere. He's got him coming in again, but that's something that we can, that the community college can do. The rest of these uh, other uh, county BLETs and stuff can't do that they can do. How much community college has great recognition, not only in Alamance County State, but also the nation because of some of the programs they brought here. So, commissioners, this item this item re requires the approval of two things to, to move forward. One is the capital project ordinance that's in the in the uh, packet. If the board wants to amend how things are funded, we, we need to be sure we're on the same uh, path with you, so we want to go slow. And, Andrew, do you have something to add or just reminded me to go that we need to be clear and concise so if the motion will include the use of art funding if the motion will include the use of five hundred thousand dollars in art funding we would add um, another budget amendment for that if, if, if the commissioner so choose to do that then we'd have another budget amendment right now we only have one budget amendment in this mix it is for the use of capital reserves to the tune of 2.5 million dollars so there's two parts capital project ordinance the budget amendment to use capital reserves if the board wants to use ARP which I think what Commissioner Turner pointed out the value in using ARP is it gives the college capacity to use their debt service uh, the debt proceeds uh, uh, take them further right then right. use the uh, up to half a million dollars perhaps of ARP to do the water sewer piece of the public safety training center as well as uh, potentially some broadband work I think I understood from Mr. Turner can I just just to be clear, because I'm not, you bond geniuses. Okay, $2.5 million is the additional cost. And I know how everything's just blowed up. Is that going to be part of this bond premium, or are they taking money like the school system just did from their capital reserves and spending that? Is that what they're doing? Or are you telling me that we're going to up the bond? I'm just going to say this. I know what this county voted for, and I'm not going to cross it because that's who I serve. I serve everybody, and I, I, I'm just not going to. I know how important this is, and we're going to find a way to do this. But is this 2.5 million, I'm borrowing more money 
on this bond that y'all say is a premium that all this stuff? The $2.5 million is from ACC's capital reserve, uh, just what the school system did, uh, where okay. they used their capital reserve to pay for their project. So in this, in this model, this proposal, the $2.5 million is use of ACC's capital reserve. This is not bond debt or bond proceeds. Okay. Mr. Good, can ACC's capital reserve funds be used for anything other than ACC capital? There's a little different restrictions with that. I, once it hits the capital reserve, though, I believe that it is limited to having to be used for ACC's uh, capital needs, and the reason is once it hits their capital reserve account. Am I correct in saying that, Andrew? Correct. So, so it, you they, didn't get the ESSER kind of money. Why they, not? <laughs> That's like the sales tax. <laughs> so we don't get I don't understand that one either. So yeah. the, the, the college does not receive the restricted sales tax as ABSS does, so that, that's a major restriction for how we use uh, school system capital. But once the funding is put into a capital uh, project fund for ACC, that's where it needs to be used. So the use of this $2.5 million, this is not bond debt, is, is uh, uh, a legitimate use of these funds and does not add uh, any bond proceeds or bond cash to, this, to any of these projects. So this is from their account yes. they already got? Yes, it is, uh, it is their capital reserve account, not bond debt or bond proceeds. Mr. Chairman, I have two motions. Uh, I'll get them sequentially. First motion is that the board allocate up to $500,000 in ARPA funding for a water sewer project for Green Level that would include investigation in broadband service for Green Level. Which would also serve ACC. Which would also serve the public Tracy, public safety training center. Just touch it. I know. Not with one Sir, may I say something about the use of our funds? I sat on a meeting the other day. If we, if we use our funds for broadband by ourselves, um, we don't qualify for great grants or. Um, project which is another 480 million I'm just saying that this is a new thing we found out the other day so when you say investigate it totally get what you're saying about putting it in the ground we have to be very careful about the terminology because then it would eliminate us from using great grant funds and so I would say investigate it find out what the price tag is, you'd be surprised when you dig everything and put everything in the pipes, the cost to put fiber in is very minimal. When we did our project between here and H, uh, the northern campus, the pipe itself was like 50 grand. Everything else was the labor. So I'm just telling you, this is a new wrinkle that we just heard the other day. I'm giving you caution in that he's been 50,000 of our funds for uh, a fiber project, it might eliminate you from qualifying for up to $16 million this next year for, for uh, fiber projects. And, and so that's part of the investigation. We're going to investigate yes. not yes. doing I that. Yes. We're not <laughs> yeah. Well, I, thank you, Bruce. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. commissioners, let me say, Bruce, Andrea, Mimi, these folks are like making ARP study and these ARP rules their lives. And I appreciate you bringing that up, Bruce. That's a great point. Uh, commissioners, I would say if you, if, you, if you follow through with this motion, half a million dollars in ARP funding, we know it's eligible for water and sewer, and we will certainly look at how could we use it for a broadband uh, project for the town of Green Level in a way that would not jeopardize us from being eligible for uh, that's, great grant. That's why you use the investigation term. That Absolutely. is the motion. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bruce. Thanks for, thanks for bringing that up. Now, Thank if you. I heard that correctly, doesn't that mean that um, there may be other funds we can use for broadband? Other sources of funds for the broadband that we might want to use in that? Is uh, that what you're saying, Bruce? So, competitively, there's a great grant program that is funded outside of our ARPA funding. It goes to come down from federal government to the states. And how much of that would come to us? Um, potentially this year up to $8 million worth of projects. Holy cow. That's if they're presented to us from the vendors. We qualify up to eight, uh, two projects up to $4 million each. But that's, we, we're putting out the notice that we want to be partners on that. Um, but that's funding that's outside of this ARPA fund. 
but if you compete with it, then you eliminate it, is what they're saying. Um, so Mr. another Turner, program called the CAP program as well. Should, Mr. Turner, should you withdraw the broadband requirement as part of the half million dollars, but ask for an investigation? That that was the motion, not no that it was a requirement, but that it was an investigation. Absolutely. Thank you. Again, this is all emerging and wonderfully changing as we go. Just like right. some I'll second that with that withdrawal. Thank you. And just one more time to state that that two point five million is not part of the bond; it's out of their pocketbook. That's that's correct. Okay. It's from the college's capital reserve, like not ABSS from. Like ABSS just did. Yes. Okay. Yes. Not not bond proceeds. So, Mr. Turner, please repeat your motion. The motion is that we allocate up to five hundred thousand dollars in ARPA funding for a water sewer project for Green Level, and that we investigate the possibility of including broadband in Green Level's service. To and facilitate that motion. To, to facilitate the law enforcement building. Correct. Yep. Yes. <coughs> And we've got a second. Any other discussion on this motion? No, I got gratification. Thank you. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? It's unanimous for the approval. Mr. Chair, my second motion is that we um, accept the, uh, Mr. Hager, what did you call the, uh, is in the packet, the uh, capital project ordinance? That we accept the, that we uh, Accept the capital project ordinance with the following modi modifications that we reduce the public safety training center's budget by $500,000 and that we accept $2.5 million in ACC's capital reserve for funding the public trace, public safety training center. Andrew, did you, you follow on that? Just, just want to make sure we're tracking with the board. What that would do is give the training center $12.9 million of capital of funding as well as another half a million dollars from ARP. Is that your intent? No. So you want they wouldn't to have to fund the $500,000 in ARP because it's already been paid for from another source. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they don't need it in their budget for the public tra training safety center. So the capital reserves could be used $2 million to fund the request for the training center and it leaves an extra half a million dollars Correct. that could go to another project. Correct. Do we need that amount of specificity? Yes, sir. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so you want to take the 500000 out of the capital Correct. reserve Correct. their money to use? Correct. <laughs> All right. So the motion is that we uh, amend the, uh, the ordinance in such a way that we reduce the Public Safety Training Center's budget by $500,000. That we allocate $2 million in ACC capital reserves to fund the Public Training Safety Center and an additional $500,000 for ACC's remaining bond program. Did you track that, Andrew? So, is there any debt issuance? No. At all. No. Other than the what we are planning to do in uh, September, because we do have another debt issuance for the college in September, as uh, demonstrated here. That's part of the original thirty-nine point six million dollars, right? So we're we're on track in September of twenty-two to issue fifteen million eight hundred forty thousand dollars in in original debt. Right, so that's that's part of it. So these we borrow money from these people, mm -hmm. and we're gonna pay this money back. And then they sting us with these little, these little duh, seventy-five thousand dollars. Who are these people? Well, if you find they're you, because you do bonds. <laughs> no, I, I haven't traded a bond in my life. Okay, <laughs> so I've traded oil and gas. It's that it's that that fair you've been talking about. And she's flying out of the skies, we speak. <laughs> On the screen, in the September 2022 original debt issuance column, for the main Powell G building, there is an amount for $3,036,070, which is part of the original $39.6 million intended uh, issuance that we would be able to budget tonight if you intend to issue in September as well as a half million dollars for that same project from the capital reserves, which means that total main Powell G project would be budgeted at $3,536,070 tonight. But, and that would keep us within the original $39.6 million 
uh, bond use, issuance that the commissioners are uh, interested in. It would be using the 39.6 million in cash and 2.5 million in capital reserves separately from the alert. Yeah. Can I make that as a third motion? Thank you. The, 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 the uh, bond issuance. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> so we got the second motion on the table. So the the, the, the <laughs> second motion is to reduce the public safety training center budget by half a million dollars. We're following this. I just want to make really sure because we don't want to come back. We're we're following. Okay, got it. I'll second the motion. Any other discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. So we just chairman, third motion is that we budget two million wait the, the question uh, Mr. Trigo, the 2.998 million is the original September bond issuance correct mm -hmm. uh, the 2.998 would be bond premium debt from April of 2021 so uh, the 15840 in the September 22 original debt issuance column that's the dollar amount left to get us to 39.6 million dollars which That's in the I'm September sorry. 22nd column, though. Yes, one of those columns is original debt issuance. That's what gets added to the uh, original debt issuance to get us to 39.6. The column, the column beside it, that is what the uh, we were discussing about using the premium from the April debt. So that 2.998, what I'm hearing is the commissioners may not be interested in using that. So that that number uh, wouldn't be used at this point. What is what is the original bond issuance number? 39.6. For September of 22. For 22? That 15,840,000 is the original bond debt issuance number uh, for September of 2022 that takes the total debt issuance for all ACC projects to 39.6. All right. So the motion is that we budget uh, out of the September 22 debt issuance the original amount of $15,840,000 plus an amount of premium simply to facilitate the purchase of the bonds. And we would come to you, I think, as we get, yes, correct me if I'm wrong, Andrew, right. as we get closer to mm -hmm. the uh, debt it's issuance it's time, with the same thing if before. one, knowing we're going to get premium or not, what the bond cost will actually be. I think that's how we did it last time. Well, the bond costs are estimated prior to the sale. So after the sale, we would get the budget amendment um, precisely done. But and what then, are those estimates? About seventy-five thousand dollars? No, it shouldn't be that much this time. Yeah, okay. it shouldn't be. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, how much are we going to issue? Twenty, eighteen million. Fifteen million eight hundred forty. Fifteen million eight hundred forty. So your cost is going to be about uh, fifteen, sixteen thousand, which will allow ACC to obtain the amount of premium. I mean, the amount of bond issue once the voters approve. Yes, sir. I really, it's just awesome to watch all of us in this room work like this with respect to the voters because that's who we all work for and they pay, they pay for everything. So I, I really appreciate that. Is that a second to his motion? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I thought you seconded it. I'll second the motion. Okay. I thought you did. Oh, that was the other one. That was the first one. Yeah, I'll second that, that motion as well. That Craig is making some motions. Yeah. <laughs> So, Andrea, at this point, do you mind, I'm sorry to ask, can you walk us through exactly where we're at right now with budgets for these projects, just to make sure we're all clear? Do you get all three? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and what it means for the, the amount of dollars that the college will have access to uh, for each project, because I think we're about to budget each one of them. Is that correct? Correct. Or maybe not the uh, satellites. We'll budget uh, main pile G at a dollar amount and not have a budget for the two satellites. So, the Center for Excellence and the Student Services Center have 
your, their total budgets were not affected by any of these votes tonight. They were already set. The first vote increased uh, budgets, the use of $500,000 in ARP funds for the Public Safety Training Center. The second vote budgeted $2 million to increase the budget for the Public Tra Safety Training Center. That uh, meets the, the request for $12,900,000 total. An additional and that's from the, ca the uh, capital reserve. From the capital reserve. And ARP. It's a combination okay. of capital reserve and American Rescue Plan $500, funds. $500,000 in ARP funds, $2 million from capital reserves, <coughs> all for the Public Safety Training Center. And then there's an additional $500,000 in capital reserves that was budgeted in your um, budget amendment number two. That $500,000 would be applied to the main Powell G building renovation project. Number three was a vote to spend $3,036,070 on the main Powell G building to be funded from Bond Park. It's the original $39.6 million in cash. It's the remainder portion that has not already been budgeted. So we've now, at, at the end of this third vote, would have vo voted to budget $39.6 million in bond funding. We will come back to the board before ever issuing debt in order to confirm and request permission. This leaves, this does not fully fund the main pile G at the $5,035,000 uh, budget that the college uh, has projected, and it does not provide funding for Satellite East or Satellite West. So is that taking Satellite East and Satellite West out of the bond project? Mm -hmm. At this point, there would be no funds allocated for it. Uh, so it would have to be, if, if those projects were going to be funded, they would need to be funded either with premium or uh, capital reserve or some other funding source. But that is not your motion, correct? Correct. That this ACC would have all of its main uh, priorities for main Powell G minus $600,000 for the library. And the money that our representatives got ACC, over $3 million, can that be used toward any of this, or is that a specific column it has to go to? That is specifically for equipment for the biotechnology center. That's okay, gotcha. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeremy had not fall asleep yet. for a five-minute recess. You know exactly what you're We're back in session. And I know it's, it's getting late, and this is a, a routine thing that we do every year, but I'll try to bring energy and enthusiasm uh, <laughs> to the advertisement of delinquent taxes. So North Carolina General Statute 105-369A requires the tax collector to report to the governing body 
the total amount of any unpaid taxes for the current fiscal year that are liens on real property. So it's not just every tax bill, it has to create a lien on real property. Upon receipt of the report, the governing body must order the tax collector to advertise the tax liens by publishing each lien at least once in a newspaper having general circulation within the county. Uh, now traditionally we break this up, about 60% of the advertisement we put in the Times News, about 40% we put in the Alamance News. And we do this uh, partly to, to comply with statute, uh, but partly we're putting the world on notice where we have a lien and we're, we're kind of perfecting that by, by letting everyone know, hey, these taxes are unpaid and we have a lien on the property. <coughs> um, one of the good things about the advertisement is it is paid for by the person that gets advertised. So if you're a taxpayer, you pay your bill on time, you don't pay for this. Uh, however, if we have to put your name in the newspaper, you get to pay for being advertised. And that's uh, part of what we're looking at uh, this evening. Now, I would suggest an amount of $5 uh, per account. Uh, this is the same amount we've used for the last 10 years. I mean, it's, um, it's getting close, though. I, I'm a little nervous about it uh, going any further forward, so you might hear about a rate increase uh, next year. Last year, we took in uh, 16500 At $5 a clip? At $5 a clip. Wow. Yeah. Which pays for the advertisement, but just barely. I bet. So we're, we're, we're getting tight, so next year I might have to, to ask for more. But right now I do think the, the five would cover it. Um, as of January 31st, the total amount of liens against real property for current year taxes was $4,755,322.54. And, of course, that's constantly going down. Uh, at close of business today, it was three million two hundred thirty thousand five hundred fifty-six dollars and ninety-nine cent. By the time we get to the point of advertising, it will be much less than that. So this is constantly falling off. So you need a motion to one post and charge five dollars per publication. Is That's that the right. motion we need to make? That's so it. I recommend uh, five dollars per parcel and advertising on or about March seventeenth. We usually do the third Thursday of March. Also move. Mm -hmm. Well, I already have, but anyway, I'll, I'll <laughs> second it. <laughs> Any other comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 It's unanimous. Aye. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's <laughs> right. Uh, Miss Evans. Uh, Ms. Evans is out, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so Andrea is going to speak to this item for EMS. <laughs> so the Alamance County Accounts Receivable and Collection Policy allows the Finance Director to remove accounts receivables that we may not collect with board approval. So once a year, we come to you and ask to write off, uh, specifically, it's EMS accounts that are uncollectible. Uh, we don't have any other accounts under this policy that need to be written off. But for this current year, uncollectible EMS accounts totaled $1,107,306.42. We're writing off uh, the year 2018 uncollectible accounts. The, uh, these are three years old, so according to our policy, we have uh, used all available methods to try to collect and no longer are able to do that. The, we, it's timed out. Therefore, we have a um, little over half a million, 543,000 that are from our main billing agency, and then another 563,000 that went through the main process as well as a collection agency, and they are not collectible. So Andrew, when we first come on, we had a vote about this thing. Was mm -hmm. it for 2017? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Correct. I thought we just did this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Every fifth. No, no, no. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Bless your heart. Now, is it always a million dollars? Last year it was 1.5. Prior to that it was lower. I have okay. those numbers. That, that, that no big deal. It's no, you don't. Yeah, it's no big deal. I was just curious. All right. Any idea how many trips or uh, I'm presuming most of these are ambulance trips. Any idea how many of these are this represents that we're not able to collect? I don't know the exact number. Uh, most of them are are private pay. So when you look at folks with the, the patients that do not have insurance, we only collect on average about 5% on those accounts. That's compared to about 95% for Medicare, 98% for Medicaid, and about 80% for private insurance. So 
that's where the majority is. So you have about a million and a half dollars each year of bills going out for private pay. You collect about 5%. That's where the, the roughly 1.2, 1.3 billion comes each year. Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. It's unanimous. Thank you. Can, do, can we do any accounting? I mean, I'm just thinking about my company who didn't get paid, and we wrote it off against our income. Can we do that? Or a county entity, I understand that generally accepting the county practices are not always the same. Yeah, I uh, the write off. I was going to say, I was, what I'm thinking is a write off, their write off. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just I'm just talking out loud. Excuse me. Excuse Andrea's me. Andrea's like, huh? Yeah. Well, I was going to say the net effect is the same in the end. I like yeah, that look. Like that was real ask. half an inch, Pam. Oh, geez. So you know. she was like, why did he ask me this? I'm yeah. gonna smile. Yeah. Well, she's trying to be nice, not call me an idiot. <laughs> and you are continuing to be Miss Evans, correct? <laughs> I'll be Miss Evans again. Okay. Um, we have brought before you um, a just notification that. Uh, it is time for us to put out a request for proposal for audit services. This is something that we've been on a three-year cycle, so we have just, uh, last year was the last year that uh, the original uh, response from Martin Starnes ended, which means we would be uh, putting out a request for pro proposal for this audit year. And uh, the deadline on that, uh, typically we would put out the, the proposal, give them uh, three, four weeks to respond, Finance director will ask a team to review the responses. They're evaluated based on price and responsiveness of their bid. And then we would bring back a recommendation to the board to award a bid by the end of May. Okay. No approve. Second. Any discussion? There being none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to ask whether you got a pay increase or decrease. <laughs> well, Susan has a voice that you can barely hear today. Okay. So oh, wow. That was our best effort. Yeah. You did a great job. <laughs> okay. Um, budget amendment, are you doing that as well? Or? We have uh, Bill Corner. You ready? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. Good evening, Mr. Oh, Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. yeah, we have a budget amendment we have, and I have Lauren Langley, who is our livestock agent, and because she did a lot of the work on it, I want to give her the credit. Okay, so she's going to tell you a little bit about it. Excellent. Okay. Thank so you. I yield my time to her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make this really short and sweet. Um, so for a couple of years now, I've really wanted to go for a community grant to get shared equipment that our farmers can rent out. Um, so uh, livestock scales, portable livestock scales, and a fire ant bait spreader because both of these pieces of equipment are really expensive for a single farm, especially a, a small farm, um, to afford. Um, so I feel like I, some of the things that I'm teaching and wanting to get farmers to implement, if I have some of these uh, pieces of equipment available, they'll be able to better use my recommendations and, um, you know, make or save more money on their farm. I'm saying this does not require a county match. No, uh-uh. Mm -mm. I, I had to come up with 15%, so Alamance County Farm Bureau helped me there. Um, so it's just a budget amendment for the county to accept it in, and the county uh -huh. has to go under contract with NC State to receive the money. Are you the new 4-H chick? No, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> I, I do livestock and forages. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, ma'am. You guys seeing, do great stuff. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I've been seeing fire ants on the University Boulevard section and uh, Grand Oaks. They've been crossing over the road. They'll hurt you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're oh, everywhere. They will. Uh, yes. well, the big thing with farms is, you know, if you got 20, 40, 60 acres to treat, you cannot do individual mound treatments, so they need a specialized spreader. So um, I think this will help get some of our fire ant problem under control, <laughs> I'm hoping anyways. Excellent. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, see the problem saying aye. 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 Now, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I don't have my results back yet. 
That's the state government. <laughs> <laughs> of course you <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Thank you for, coming. Thank you for <laughs> waiting. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Madam Clerk, we do not have any additional speakers. Is that correct? That's yes, correct. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, they didn't make it. Okay, Commissioner responses. Um, and we'll have comments later, so I assume there are none. County Attorney's Report. I have nothing. Deborah? No. No, Deborah's still with us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> County Manager's Report. No report, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mm. All right. Um, Commissioner's comments. I have some, but I'm going to yield to you folks first. <coughs> Any commissioner comments? Uh, maybe just one for me. I know the uh, ABSS board's meeting tomorrow to consider uh, a mask situation. It's only the only item on the agenda. I hope the uh, ABSS uh, makes mask optional. Like they, like it's. I think it's overdue, and I uh, hope that they uh, make mask optional for our students. Thank you. And that's exactly what I was going to say. Me too. Word for word. Yep. Well, everybody uh, else has figured it out. Now it's time for them to figure it out. Exactly. I really encourage masks being voluntary only, uh, no mandate. Any other commissioners? Help me a little bit, Brian. Um, we had the um, Veterans Community Project leaders to come here a couple weeks ago. And we had tremendous support from the City of Burlington, the Chamber, DSS, Tony was so navy around these people and I just everybody it was absolutely amazing to have these guys to come in meet Jay Baker we had a 96 year old veteran and his um his that was in World War II his son was there who was a Germany war he was a POW and just to see the excitement in them for um, developing homeless situation housing for our veterans who have been struggling for so long um, we got word from them this week. I'll let Brian say that because I don't want to mess it up. But I, I would like to say that um, I got a call not too long ago from a pastor that was working with a Marine who was living in his car and he was a double Purple Heart recipient and missing a leg from an IED explosion in Afghanistan. And the thought of him living in his car is <laughs> no. Um, and there's so many like him. I went to the Alco Vets uh, dinner down at Lamb's Chapel. I mean, I donated because I believe in what they're doing as a retreat for private. It's not a living situation. It's not for homeless vets, which we have. You wouldn't, you'd be surprised. But um, I support anything with the veterans. We had amazing speakers that night. And when I come out, it felt like it, it, my face stung because it was so cold. And I looked at my husband. I said, right now, there is a soldier in a sleeping bag, in a makeshift tent somewhere in the woods that's dealing with terrible mind movies of being in the military, of how many deployments, and has come back here and is so lost. And um, as the mother of a recent veteran and the daughter of a Korean War veteran, it's just very serious. And um, the guys from there just loved our county, the unbelievable support. I thought we was going to have a firefight at the, at the depot because it became Army versus Marine. Our own <laughs> county manager mentioned that. So, um, but I've never been around and been so honored to be around <clears throat> this quality of human being that signs up to take care of me while I sit here and, and, and be fortunately a female leader. I couldn't do this in certain countries in this world. And none of us could be leaders in certain countries as we'll be told what to do and what we see on the national news and where we're headed and how soldiers have been asked to leave because of vaccines and it's absolutely ridiculous and I'm not even going to go there because I'm just a mom speaking but I really they really love our county they want to come here and I'm going to let Brian finish my sentence but I went to see the movie Dog this weekend with um, Channing Tatum yeah and he's a former Army Ranger vet and, is, and had a lot of head injuries and this, and this thing. And he's going to take this Army dog who was a, mm, on this thing and to watch what he went through and how he was struggling and how he goes to his friend's funeral that was this dog's owner because of a suicide that happens way too often. And, um, and how they worked with this and how the trip of these two, this dog and this veteran, 
ended up saving each other. And I belong to a Proud Moms of uh, Fort Stewart. And I mean, it's really a complaint session about who their sons might be dating. But I'm seeing this week where my son got the call. He got called up. We're at the call, I got the call. So a lot of us don't know what's going on with our military, but I'm just telling you. And one mom said today, she said, my son's best friend took his life and he's really struggling, another soldier. And so um, the thought of our military boys and girls and guys living on the streets, living on a park bench, living in their car, or God knows where they're living is absolutely unacceptable because they sure stood up for us. And Brian, could you just kind of go a little bit more because you're so much smarter than I am and I called Brian in tears Saturday after I saw this movie I shouldn't have called anybody and um, he really helped me to understand that it was going to be okay it could be okay but um, I cannot encourage you gentlemen the way we support the diversion center the way we support the sheriff's department the way we support ACC education we need to support everybody but these drug issues cross over into our soldiers that are now home that are struggling. I've got several that, that have been to deployment, have come back and have had injuries and got addicted to opiates because they had to stay in the hospital for a while and it's just there so easy. We cannot leave them behind because they never left us behind. Where would we be in America if we didn't have the soldier? I mean, we've got one right here on the end who's absolutely amazing. You will take me to Top Gun 2 <laughs> and, and pay for my ticket because we'll be watching you on the screen. But um, I, just, I just pray this is something we can do. This is the, one of the only reasons I ran for office was to take care of our soldiers. And there's a lot of silence that nobody talks about, that these soldiers don't talk about. They cannot be living in the woods. They deserve better than that. And this is proven. They're getting ready to do their fifth site. They raise money. They're absolutely amazing. And I just hope my state, my county, will be want to be part of something so amazing to make a difference for these men and women. I have one question. Uh, this ordinance on ACC, I assume it has to be amended before we can sign it, correct? Oh, if you've got that and pass it around, we'll, we'll do that now. <clears throat> so I just Commissioner Thompson uh, I will I will tell the board that uh, there, there was good news from the folks from uh, Veterans Community Project as Commissioner Thompson mentioned I think first of all just to hear that this group has looked at our county and our region they were they were clear to say that uh, you know they would look at a location in Alamance County as something that would be a regional draw between the triad and the triangle for veterans that need help whether that's homelessness or uh, the other wraparound services that they offer so I took it personally as good news that uh, they have looked at our area and said we could come here. We have service to give here. There are numbers of veterans that need help uh, uh, in this region that would benefit from our presence. That is good for Alamance County veterans. That's also good for our region veterans. That was good news. Uh, the, the folks from VCP also indicated that the site was good. They, we took them to the Kernodal property over at the corner of uh, Vaughn Road and Graham Hopedale Road. They were very impressed with that site. As you know, it's the former site of the Kernodal Clinic. It's graded, water sewer availability. And I think the real big key for uh, the VCP folks was uh, the, the connection with the health department, Department of Social Services, Open Door Clinic, the dental clinic. Tremendous amount of uh, health support and social service type support in a very nearby, very adjacent, right, right across the street. So they did believe that that was an excellent site. One thing they made very clear in their response to us is they did not see the need for annual ongoing contributions from Alamance County. So uh, their interest is in talking with us about the capital one-time cost. So they were clear to say they felt like after looking at the region and the county that they would be able to sustain themselves on an annual basis, right, for operations. So that is not uh, part of the consideration that the county would need to give. This is about the one-time capital upfront developing the property cost. Uh, they have not yet given us what they think that might be while they were visiting with us. I think it, uh, they made it very clear that they sponsor <clears throat> out much of their construction. There are parts of the construction that they can't sponsor out. Water, sewer, th the less flashy pieces of building a facility on this property. So I think all the news at this point was good. I think, uh, you know, we have, we have, when we presented to the commissioners the comprehensive list of potential ways to spend ARP on Alamance County projects. This was one that we put in there. 
it is uh, talking with Andrea is an eligible uh, expense for ARP, prod, uh, ARP dollars. Uh, I think we had estimated a one-time capital total build out might be five million dollars for that site. Uh, I think that's high. After they looked at the site, it was smaller than the other sites that they use. So I don't think you would see quite as many of the homes built there uh, as they do in some of the larger cities. But they were still very interested in the site. So I, I hazard to say that a one-time capital contribution from ARP from Alamance County would probably be less than $5 million. And again, good news is they're not, uh, they feel like they can sustain themselves uh, on an on a ongoing basis. So I think it was all good news. We are going to wait to, we should hear from them very soon about the dollar amount they believe. They're looking at the site and what the build out might look like for them and what portion of that they might ask the county to consider uh, from ARP dollars. I think that is an important piece for them though, is uh, that one-time capital piece uh, to, to help make sure they can, they can come here. But all, overall, very good, great uh, group of people that they met with here. I think uh, meeting with folks like uh, Jay Baker, you know, if I'm as guilty as anyone else of not really understanding the homeless veteran situation, even in Alamance County, but when you sit down with Jay Baker from Allied Churches and you hear from him, the number of homeless vets that come through uh, Allied Churches or the number of people they're trying to help uh, that I think his term was couch surf. Mm -hmm. They have no, they don't have their own home. They're just going from place to place. It's more than you think. It's enough that these folks feel like they're justified to come here. So that, that was all I thought good news and uh, we will certainly keep the board posted once we hear from BCP what we what they believe the one-time dollar amount uh, would be from the county we will keep you uh, posted but I know um, uh, the group of folks that participated as well as uh, veterans in the county appreciated uh, Commissioner Thompson's leadership in bringing them here and uh, and getting them to look at Alamance County and consider it because I think their their services would be beneficial to veterans. So thank you. It was an unbelievable group of people that I got to sit at the table with. It was just just an honor. It really was. Thank you. I think Mr. Turner has a question about the ordinance. Uh, uh, bond issuance cost of seventy four thousand seven hundred dollars. What was that? That was the April. We're we're continuing to budget that seventy four thousand that was already spent in April. That's okay. what we paid last time. Right. That's correct. And we're probably going to have to pay about another fifteen or twenty. Yeah, that was, get, my, that, was my, I, that was my that was my only question. Thank you. Hey, didn't, doesn't Burlington already have water and sewer over there? That's yeah, they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. they do. Where? And then you said there was Cardinal additional Clinic water site. and sewer costs. Is that just to put water and sewer to individual units? Yeah. Yes, I would I would imagine that once they, you know, if VCP gets as far as doing a design for the site because it's it's. Um, the housing as well as their uh, facility where they do their other services. So there would be a need to expand the water and sewer into the property. Um, and I think that's what they're going to look at is costs for the, for the one-time build that they don't feel like they would be able to get corporate or private help for because of the nature mm -hmm. of, the, of those costs. So what we saw in Kansas City was they put corporate and private names on everything that they could, right? So the homes, the center, the rooms, the, Everything was had some level of sponsorship, but I think some of these hidden hidden improvements that have to be made. That's what I think we will hear from them um, that they, they may look to the get on that cost. No, but uh, we should get that any day uh, from. Now, we own the land, right? That is correct. So we would donate that land, I guess. I think we'd have to figure out how best to do that. It could be. Uh, uh, I don't know that we could donate it to them. I think we went through this before when we attempted to sell that property. There was another nonprofit interested in it. We had to go through a uh, sealed bid. There, there are laws that would govern how we would transfer, or we may not want to transfer. The county may want to maintain ownership of it and allow them to build on it and work into some kind of lease arrangement. What, I don't know. Uh, but I am sure that there would be a way if the board were interested to, to figure that out, so. Thank you. Yes, Thank very you. nice. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. <laughs> have a motion to second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Commissioner meetings typically occur on the first and third Monday of each month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. The first Monday meeting begins at 9.30 a.m. and the third Monday meeting begins at 6.30 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting will be broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgov.com 
www.govtvnc.com for more information about their schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash Alamance County NC or by clicking the YouTube link on the county website. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of this meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about the commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.